you that you've been able to join us today. If you recall from Monday, we've been having a session where we are discussing a number of issues on the work that we've been able to do on defending democracy. On Monday, we had a very exciting session on the power of, the power of uh, partnerships, dynamic partnerships in defending democracy, where we were able to explore different ways of uh, defending democracy. Yesterday, we had another very exciting session on the state of democracy during COVID-19. And today, again, we've lined up a very, very, very exciting session on women and democracy. And the reason why we have this session today is just to have a platform where women can come and speak what is the space for women in terms of democracy. And we have a very exciting panel again. We have brought to you today a very bold and courageous woman in Africa, Dr. Stella Nyanzi, who's going to be with us. And we are calling this session one-on-one -on -one with Dr. Stella Nyanzi. And today we have a group of also young and courageous women, very ambitious women, women who want to take part in democratic talks, where they'll have a chance to just speak with Dr. Dr. Stella Nyanzi, ask her questions, get to hear her live experience, get to know how she has been able to do it all these years. And you'll ask yourself, why are we doing this? Uh, most of the time, we, we build scenarios, we imagine things that probably we just think that will happen, but today we want to be able to hear from Dr. Stella herself. How has she managed to be able to defend democracy all this time? So we welcome you and also remind you to follow us on our Twitter and on our social media platforms. The hashtag is Defending Democracy. So without much further ado, I welcome Dr. Njokin Dungu, who is going to be our moderator for today. Welcome, Jockey. Hi, everybody. Uh, one of the things that happens to me a lot, a lot, um, it's happened, I think, for years now, is that people call me Jockey Ndongo um, after the Supreme Court judge. I don't mind at all. She's amazing. Um, but unfortunately, that's not my name. My name is Joaquin Gomi. I am a member of the Nest Collective. We are a multidisciplinary collective living and working in Nairobi. Um, we, we, we are one of, one of our partners is Forum Save, and we are really, really grateful um, to be here. We are especially grateful to be here um, to speak with Dr. Stella Nyanzi and to talk about um, multiple, multiple things um, and definitely have a very, very interactive talk with everybody who's here. Hi, everybody. Please wave at me so I don't feel lonely. <laughs> Hi. Um, just before we begin, uh, we have a couple of spoken word performances. We're going to do one now and then we're going to do one right in the middle of our conversation when we're just kind of taking a breather so that we can change around the themes that we're discussing. I would like to invite Atieno to the, to the stage so that she can give us her piece. Atieno, where are you? Uh, let's give her a hand as she comes. How quickly we forgot, forgot to breathe, forgot to slow down, forgot to shut up and listen to the sobbing of our unborn babies, the ones supposed to be the lights at the end of tomorrow. We forgot about tomorrow, about the freedom that comes with the hope of a revolution, power that rises with the offspring of the resilient. A victory that is won by soldiers who will not but stand up. Like mountains, they will not be moved. They refuse to compromise. Their no remains no. Truth, their yes and amen. Faith, a pool amidst the desert. And hope, as vivid as the spelling of their last names. They know, they know that today may be the sound of the roar of many waters, but tomorrow is a ball of sunshine that will kiss the lips of the faithful. But how quickly we forgot, forgot to be faithful to our conscience and our spirits. We played the game as though the power was not already in our hands. Gave up the cards that we knew so well would unshackle our, the ankles of our sons and our daughters. Surrendered our voices like we didn't have anything to say. Now we don't have anything to say. Did we not accept their thin paper, the one with which they bought our rights for? Did we not not question the promises they printed and stuck on the walls of our houses? Did we not agree to give them the key to our state house? They got us right where they wanted to. Now our existence is a gateway to their fantasy, our complacency a rub of salt to the injury. 
Oh, how quickly we forget. Forget about pain. The pain in giving birth. Giving birth to children who will not survive tomorrow. Tomorrow, sons will die fighting for their fathers who died fighting for their freedom. Daughters will be hidden in the footnotes of history books. Their presence acknowledged, but their voices, not so much. Brothers will be found on the streets begging for a small bite of the cake, but crumbs will be thrown to the ground like dogs. They will lick the remains from the ground with their tongues, an opportune moment to finish them with their heads down. Like dogs, they will find their way home for their mothers to lay them at a place of rest. A place of rest. Is not the search for rest what got us here in the first place? Um, I'd like to invite, uh, like, can we please give Atieno a hand? That, that, that was an incredible poem. It was an incredible poem. Thank you. Thank you, Atieno, for sharing those words with us. Um, uh, Stella is also a poet, and it would be really beautiful to hear what her thoughts are about this poem, and I'd like to invite her to please um, come on so that we can start our conversation. Let's give her a hand, Tafa Valley. Which one do you want? Atieno, Atieno, where are you? I salute you, Atieno, fellow soldier, who uses words amazingly. I mean, I, I love poetry because it does things that other media can't. And um, I, I, I started just listening and enjoying. There's a bead on your hair. I was, I was staring at the bead, and then I moved from the bead, and I got into the spirit behind the words. Amazing. Sometimes smiling, but also moved deeply, emotively. Thank you. I salute you, comrade. So, first of all, we must refuse to be mere footnotes. Right? Yes. Um, for, uh, I'll start with the know She's written the poem. Yeah. I think, yes? Salute, salute, salute. We must contribute something. Yes. I am not going to write myself into a footnote. My name will be there. Poet, poetess, whatever you choose. Atieno. And I think women must insist that. Um, we, 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 we must refuse the silencing. And we don't do it by being silent. We do it by articulating, by producing, by by reproducing, by, by expressing ourselves, by insisting on being there, on being heard, on being seen, on producing these things, on participating. Right. We talked about women voting. Right. And some people think it's merely voting. Mm, mm, Actually, mm. it's not. It's grabbing our constitutional right mm. to change and participate in politics, in the change of government regime. Right. I think that many people, I come from Uganda, and I love my country, and right now we are preparing for the 2021 general elections where we choose the president yes. and we, members of parliament yes. and local government councillors. Yes. And in Uganda, the opposition, I'm in the opposition, I'm always opposing the dictatorship of Yoweri Museveni. In Uganda, the opposition, many of us are very tired because it's become a sham. Mm. The, the opposition has become a sham or the political process has become the a sham? The elections. The political process is many things, but right. the elections have become a sham where we have a dictator who's been in power since 1986. Who was born after 1986? Don't put up your hand if you have a problem with age and being known as a woman. But there are very many. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Lots of them. Our president has been in power much longer than you've been alive. Okay. And so many people participate in elections, mm -hmm. think, uh, and, 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 listen, and, he's on the ballot for 2021. He wants to come back for another five years, right? So 35 plus... 35 plus another five. Plus five is what? 40. 40. I'm 46. I feel like I've lived a long time, okay? Right. But he wants 
40 years. And so a lot of us in the opposition feel like, what are we doing anyway? Mm -hmm. And there are people who are tired of going to the ballot. The energy, the fatigue to go back because they're like, it's rigged. I keep saying to women, come and participate because it's your constitutional right. Whatever the process is like, right. you'll be contributing. Right. And they're like, but the elections are rigged. And I'm like, if you can't even participate in voting, how will you con... How will you stand? How will you contest? <laughs> mm. If you can't dare to say, it's a sham, but my constitutional right is to participate. I'm going to wake up in the morning and vote. I'm going to register. We have a registration process. Yes. Our registers... Our registers uh, are the material for lots of poems that mm. would make people cry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? Um... And so first of all, I think for me that as women, our protest is about being there. It, 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 it means we have, to, we, have to, we have to be present. Yes. And, and being present, not just as many of us are used as... Um, proxies. Proxies. We do the campaigns, we sing the songs and dance, we cook the food as the men go away to participate. We wear the campaign lessons. We sing the slogan songs, we do everything, but then we are not necessarily putting our vote where it matters. Those of us who contest, there's voting. Right. But I want women to participate and stand for different positions. It's mm. important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because we are not going to get away from the footnotes and become the main script if we don't push ourselves forward. And often it's a protest because they don't want us there. It's no. very expensive to participate in elections. It is. It is. Financially, emotionally, time insults. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> if a woman is single, how many single ladies are in the audience? Okay. So many times they're like, where is her man? As if we can't do things on our own. Mm, and mm, then mm. if you get a younger lover like I did, oh God, it's even worse. <laughs> and, so, and so the cost... Is it funny? No, not <laughs> at all. Shall I be laughing? I think it's great. Mm. But then the shame that comes with it. When right. I was single, they called me a lesbian. Right. And I was like, but lesbian, I'm a mama. They're like, even lesbians can get mamas. So fronting my sons and saying I have twin sons didn't help. Mm. Okay? But even that is an insistence on you will acknowledge I am there, single with my sons and my daughter. Yes. So I got myself a young lover. Yes. He's younger than me by, how old, Roy? Is he younger than me? Maybe 10 years, maybe okay. more than 10. Right. And it became the story like, oh, how can she represent us when she has a young lover? And I thought, guys, make up your mind. What do you want? I mean, do you, do you, want, do you want somebody who's single? Do you want, do you want somebody who has woman? a lover? Do you really hate the lesbian? Now I got a man. I'm so heterosexual. I have a young man on my arm. You have a problem. And this, then you know what happened? Because, because the square root of the problem is you. You are the problem. I refuse to be a problem. I'm the solution. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And I think that we have to start rewriting these histories. Yes. They will know there was a Stella Nyanzi. She was there in that line. Yes. They took her to jail and they thought they'd cut off her wings. She came back with double wings. Yes, flying, flying, flying saying, higher. You will nominate me. Mm. Why are nominations done by men? So that they can nominate more men. Why don't women also become nominators and seconders? I don't know what the process is in Kenya. Um, the, the political party process, I think, is very similar everywhere. But then I think everybody is used to meeting the choice at the ballot without realizing that the choice begins way before by being a member of a political party, uh, by being there when they're doing nomination, etc., etc. And, and I think maybe, um, maybe this would be the to ask you so you're running for mp currently yes what's what's let's give her a hand please <laughs> i'm running <laughs> um what, what 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 does that mean especially at the party process because the party process is not familiar to a lot of us it feels like the political party is like a black box and so then the nomination happens there um then there's all the back the back door meetings where people are visited at home and told you step down so that we, we can front this other person for the unity of the party. You know what I mean? And so everybody performs this kind of unity of the party. And so if we arrive at the place where, where you are, where it is you who's running, and then a lot, a lot of times the thing that will happen is that further along the line, um, two parties will form a coalition. And then you're told, now we have to decide 
one person runs as opposed to the two of you who are going to run under separate parties and then now somebody will come to you and ask you or somebody will come to whoever it is and ask them, can you step down? So there's a lot in this political process that can be very opaque. But then, because you're running, you've been, you've been part of it from the very beginning. And so could you tell us a little bit about that? Right, so you raise important questions. I didn't know about political parties until... I've said it wrong. We've had political parties. I know the names, yes. I know the presidents, I know the colors, and yes. all that. Yes. But I didn't know the value of belonging in a political party until when I was in jail. Aha. Uh -huh. And I needed people who were bold enough to speak up for me mm -hmm. when my voice was no longer there. Yes. People who knew she's an opposition activist and uh, we need to back her when mm. the state is saying she's stupid, she's insane, she's immoral, she's etc, etc. Right. I needed a group of people to back me and say, no, she's a Ugandan opposing the government. And so I belong to an opposition party called Forum for Democratic Change. It is, um, yes, and that's our sign. Our sign is two fingers. It's uh, FDC, it's blue. Um, for a long time, our presidential candidate uh, was the main opposer mm. against Yoweri Museveni. Yes. We have learned to be defiant. Why this little bit of history or background is important as a preface is because Many women think, why should I participate in political parties? Huh? Well, what, what does it do for me? And I say to them, find out what it's like. You talked about opacity or opaqueness. Yes. Many of us don't know what's in the party. When I, after jail, I get into finding out what do women do. Yes. In my political party. Yes. And I discovered there's so many vacuums, apart from cooking food, because I don't like cooking food. I enjoy good food when it's cooked by others. Mm. I'm one of those women, yeah. But um, I, I didn't want to join a political party and become a cook. I'm mm. not going to cook for men. Mm. I want to participate in the articulation and whatever it is. I want to sit like a man and say, what are the issues? Or sit like a lady and say, what are the issues? But right. I want to participate and be in the mainstream in the leadership. When I got into FDC, I discovered that the leadership comprises men. Only. The president, the secretary, the secretary general, and then women are vices. Aha. Women are secretaries. Mm -hmm. The headquarter is manned by men, but the people who are actually doing the typing, the receptionist work, the filing, are women. The admin and the support. Yes. A lot of the technical people are men, the faces we see. Right. But the support that's working from six to six are women. Yes. And I thought, that's a place one can start. Mm. There is a huge vacuum in our party because many women that we have are defiant protesters and they want to go to the roads. But because the police hits us like they hit, I don't know what. Yes. Many young women are discouraged after one period of arrest. Mm. Right. And so even what's sexy and attractive about the FDC, we, we, we are known for defiance. We do defiant things. We refuse to put our heads down. There's a spirit of resilience in that party. Our modes of organizing are crippled because of lack of human resources. Right. And so there are things like we complain about the tallies being stolen. I say to them, show me who is doing the tallies for the 2021. And we have computers, but no people. Right. Okay? Yes. Most of the people are volunteers who are young men. Okay? I want to celebrate. Where is the lady who was behind the camera? My sister. What's your name? Masuza. Masuza. Asuza. There is a lot of technical um, skill that's required in our political parties. It could be something you do well with your painted fingernails. It could be a phone. It could be capturing a picture. It could be sharing the story on your phone as a citizen journalist. It could be telling the story. It could be doing whatever it is. We celebrate you, my sister, because you're behind a technical machine with the men. Okay, we celebrate the men as well. But I celebrate you because Njoki said to me, until we have women taking on the technical hardcore stuff, huh? 
leave it for the brothers. Until we have women, I love to acknowledge transgender women as well. They're mm. part of our collective. Mm, mm. Until we have women at the forefront of telling these stories, women at the forefront of dismantling our dictatorships and patriarchy and whatever form of opposition and oppression. Yeah. Until we have women, we shall remain in a TNO's footnotes. Mm. Right? Yeah. And so political parties are difficult. They are very misogynist. The men want to take the acknowledgement for what we have done. And they want to blame the women for all the technical failures. And all the failures in general. But mainly the technical ones. Mm -hmm. But also the failures when we lose. Eh? Mm. It's the women who are supporting Museveni. In my country. I don't know about Uhuru. And I should be very polite because I have to cross back. <laughs> right? But who is guarding the votes? Yeah. You tell me. Who's guarding the votes? The brothers with their penises. Do we need a penis to guard the votes? Who's counting the tallies? The brothers. The brothers with their penises. Do we need a penis to count votes sincerely? <laughs> Who is the electoral commission uh, per personnel? Mm -hmm. Like really, like really, really, really. We have neglected the duty, many of us. We want to celebrate the women who are involved in the electoral processes, in the political parties, in... Like, like the ones who are doing the running, like you, but then we don't celebrate the women who are doing all of the technical all stuff the technical behind stuff. the scenes. And we can be those women if we, we choose to be. We can be those people because it's just a human being with a hands and a mind and a will to serve the nation. Yeah. It's not your vagina that's going to put you behind. So bring the vaginas to the front line, I say all the time. Mm. Because your vagina, even when it's menstruating, can still allow your head to do what the heads are doing. That's very true. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay, I'm not saying vaginas because I'm a you know, I like saying vaginas all the time. Um, but our vaginas should not be left home or in the... Now we've entered corporate world and we've entered the universities and academia. Let's come to politics as well. Many more of us. I'd like to see lots of vaginas at the forefront. You know, like in the history. Right. The footnotes are okay, but for me, uh-uh, they're not enough. I want to celebrate this lady. She says to me, she is part of the deep state. Ah, no, I said I want to be part of the deep state. And you're not supposed to say things like those in public. Really? <laughs> no. Because then if people know that you want to be part of the deep state, you can't join it. Oh, sorry. Whoops. Okay, so so she doesn't want to be part of the I deep don't. state. I don't. But actually she does. <laughs> <laughs> because I say to Njoki, I say to Njoki, look, no, me, I want to be acknowledged. I want to be the main story because our stories often are silenced. Yeah. Why? Yeah. And when we do participate, insist on being naming that they will know she was a she. There's a, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to just kind of enter into this political party space yes. with you a little longer because you've said something about how the political party can be a very misogynist space. And yeah. for us, we have, to, we have to redeem these spaces from being spaces that hate us, from being spaces that demean us, from being spaces that dehumanize us. And so if we're supposed to come from zero to participating in a political party, how do we start to turn around that misogynist DNA? So, so I know that there are places such as your country, I think, where women and feminists have formed their own parties. Right? Yes. Where it's a political party that's known for women. Yes. And it's mainly doing feminist things or women in development sort of things, women in politics. Right. That's one route, right? But because I think that those who oppress us, those who abuse uh, democracy, often the dictators and authoritarian people are strong men, mm -hmm. the faces of dictatorship and authoritarianism are men. Yes. Many times the political parties need the macho will to be formed, to mm. be run, to mm -hmm. be maintained, the funding as well. Yes. So one way to redress the narrative, one way to dismantle the idea that political parties belong to men yeah. is to do what some have done and make their own parties. We are mm. just a woman-led, women-run, women-agenda party. That's one route and I, ce I celebrate it. However, for me, I want to be there with the men doing the things that humans do when we rule and have power. And so the political parties that are very male-dominated, male-centered, male-driven, 
need our penetration. Like I said, it's very misogynistic. Often some of the things that exclude us are money. Yes. To participate, you need to pay. Mm -hmm. To participate, you need a par particular outlook. To participate, even in liberation or opposition movement, progressive movements, often the cost it takes it's is very exclusionary. High. It mm -hmm. will exclude women. Yeah. And so for me, I find that women need to back other women. That's the first thing. Okay? We can, we can form collectives where we are supporting each other. Where, look, I'm running for the campaign. I'm, I'm running uh, as a member of parliament in Kampala district. Kampala district. Our capital city is Kampala, but I have eight constituencies. Yes. Eight subdivisions in the city. Um, it is very expensive. I've been an ex-prisoner and before prison for 15 months, I was at the university where I was suspended. So five years of unemployment. Yeah. Just the financial cost of buying enough bitengi. You know bitengi? Yes. Uh-huh. So as we wear blue because I'm in FTC. Blue kitengi, blue shoes. I'm wearing my blue shoes from the campaign trail. Blue hat, blue key, blue handbag, blue water bottle. Like everything is about branding. Yes. And while for many people this is very easy, mm. I find that it's other women who are buying my retaining. Mm. Okay? I, I'm just saying very, very simple ways of dismantling the idea that we cannot afford the cost. Who says I can't afford the cost? When you can lend me your blue earrings, don't lend me because it's not very hygienic. Buy me <laughs> earrings! <laughs> Okay, and this is very simple. Yes. Give me the ideas. I know a lot of women who are excluded, not because they have the education. In yeah. my case, they need an A level. A level would be form that that would be form six here, but we don't do A levels. What do you? Okay. We we get form to we get to like secondary four and then go to university after that. So it's, it's we need the qualification prior to the one that makes you enter university or college. Yes, that would be high school. Okay, high school. So. There are many women who have the education qualification, mm. but what they lack is the social capital. Yes. My father was not. So and so. My family is from ghetto X. Do you have ghettos here? Slums? Yes. yes. So I'm from Mazare slum. I don't have the social capital backing me. But there are all these other big fat cats who are women. Why don't we back these younger women? Okay? Many political parties have oppressive regimes because there's a lack of policy running the party. Mm. And so some of the worst offenders are political party members in the opposition in my case. Yeah. Who are abusing women. <laughs> okay? Taking our labor for granted. It's 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 good to volunteer, but then women are working and we're being abused in yeah. the space where we work. Yes. Sometimes sexually. Sometimes you have to ex exchange sex for forms. I've had that in some political parties. Um S sex, yeah, sleeping with the people that determine where one can who will be nominated and exactly. who won't. Exactly. Um, sometimes we are beaten up. I've heard of violence, actual violence by leaders in some political parties, abusing women who are offering free labor to the political party. Yeah. Sometimes the accusations are about the hours that we work. When we start campaigns and they're door to door or rallies, rallies have been banned because of COVID-19. Sometimes the hours are very late. And so our male partners at home or our in-laws begin the stories. Yes. Right. Um, and so how do we change these spaces? I think I've given four or five ways we can. I'm interested particularly in this idea of participating collectively. Right. Because a space that is scary for one person may not necessarily be scary for five. Right. And so if, for instance, our sister here decides that she wants to run, if she doesn't have to go into the political headquarters by herself she has two three four other people who will come with her there's somebody who is there they're posing as her pa so that the people that are receiving her forms know that you can't mess around with her you know and maybe that's a thing that we could consider how do we share the money burdens how do we share the time burdens how do we share the emotional burdens because when she comes back from that um party headquarters she's probably going to need somewhere to cry and vent and be angry because of the nonsense that they put her through. Mm. So if we were to think about those political sacrifices that we often demand of one person, that we often demand of you, Mehmiwa, um, you do 
you do all of the things and then we will stand there in the corner and cheer for you as opposed to all go together very good idea i mean look i want to introduce where is derek mate he's on my team where is roy somewhere and my driver Badiru. my team comprises three young men who crossed with me into the border why mm -hmm. are there no women the hours the permission right yeah when i went to register so in uganda we do these crazy things where a team of guys goes singing around you like yeah, i don't know Swahili, but in uganda it would be hey, 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 hey mama that's common i mean that's to napenda <laughs> stella kama pesa correct okay, so i've translated from uganda but the people doing this dancing shaking writing all of these guys are men mm. the people on motorbikes driving into the are men, men. Mm. the guys saying let's put up your posters are men the mm. people taking me out like oh god it was so hard and are men mm -hmm. many of the funders of my campaign are men not because i haven't asked women for money it's just because somehow women think oh, ah, putting your money behind another woman hey like 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 come on guys yeah i don't know what holds us back i think to be fair mm. um i think because of being born into and socialized into mm. patriarchal ways of thinking of being um we know that it is we know that it is risky and people people feel people may feel and i'm not i'm not saying that it is that it is justifiable i'm just saying that people consider that a valid way of thinking that why would i put my everything all of my hopes all of my because it 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 would hurt more for you to lose you know like i would feel that worse than if you know the men continued all of the nonsense that they continue doing but then if I put my things behind you and you disappoint me, for whatever reason, I will take that as a worse crime against myself, against my being. Um, what do you think of that thought? Well, so look, so I was told that appearance matters. I might give you ways in which women can help. Yeah. I wear a kitamba to yeah. hide my dreadlocks. I had to cut off my dreadlocks in prison when I had a miscarriage and I refused the prison system to punish me, so I punished myself quickly for being mm. a bad mother and I chopped off my dreadlocks. Mm. They're just growing back, right? So I walk around with a headscarf on my head. The man telling me, Stella, your headscarf is crooked, is Roy. Mm. Why mm -hmm. can't another woman? <laughs> okay, some things, you know, like the messaging. Right. Why does the messaging, it, you, you talked about risk. Yes. Okay, let's say we are physically weaker. Let's say, I don't agree, mm -hmm. but let's say we are physically weaker and because of different physical, biological, what's the word? We are not going to put ourselves at risk. I as mean, we're, 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 like, we're socialized to be less dangerous. I don't agree. Look, I'm dangerous. Yes. Ah. That's, that's true, but like, to be, to be less physically <laughs> offensive. You know what I mean? Where do you get that crap from? Socialization. I was a refugee in this country. Mm -hmm. Why am I a little different? What? I, 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 I refuse the exceptionalism. I think we... Okay, fine. Maybe socialization says we should sit like little nice girls mm. and we should be at the back. In, in, my, in my culture, we should be seen but never hard. Yeah. And so a woman like me who speaks and speaks, and I don't speak clean all the time. Sometimes I'm clean. Sometimes I'm dirty. Yeah. I, I like to be, I define myself for who I'm, I, uh, for whatever I want it to be. Yes. I set my own agenda. Yes. Does it make me less of a good Buganda woman? Do I become less of a woman, an African woman? I'm still wearing kitengi. Mm. You know, I still speak English like I'm Uganda. And I still claim my Africanness. So I think the idea of risk and danger and our possibilities as women yeah has to be reconceptualized for ourselves we cannot allow our daughters mm. and our granddaughters to think that we can't take on risk as much as men can why because we have wombs i think i think and, and this is an interesting thought because it kind of now cycles into the idea of the woman in the private space um which is where a lot of all of the wrangling about whether you end up in public space or not happens and so there are multiple stories about women being limited by the women who went before them where you are told because this happened to us when we tried we don't want that for you 
and so or or and that's the benign version the other version is you will not get x and y and z if you behave like this you will not be able to access this or that or the other if you know you're too out there you're too this you're too that um and a lot of people then kind of weigh their options and decide um if i'm going to be under the boot of patriarchy anyway i might as well you know do the do the performance of the good woman and then because the performance of the good woman is apparently quote unquote working even though we know that feminists say that it doesn't work for long it doesn't because it's not designed to work so it's going to fail you at some point um even though it's not failing you now it will um but then like now you find that a lot a lot of a lot of a lot of women will then try to contain the efforts of other women will try to um barricade um the accesses of younger women um after them true i mean look so so first of all we celebrate all those great mothers great grandmothers yes. who came before us yes. because they are there yes the idea that we are the beginners should be dismantled absolutely there are very many great women in africa in kenya in uganda in east africa in the world really who have done things we dream of and things we should emulate yes back to communal participation and supporting each other yeah. building social capital i think that for me when i looked at the history of who's been proposing who in my party i thought ah but we have strong women mm. the vice chair and the as, uh, deputy president are women yes i am not going to be nominated by a man and although the requirement is that the bigger the name of your proposer yeah. the bigger the names of your seconders and your nominators the more likelihood of going through we have a very rigorous um verification confirmation nomination process in my party yes and so the bigger the name the better yeah and as like but i can i can get a woman and give her some of my power because i'm big enough i don't mm. need to be nominated the party needs me mm-hmm. more than i need the party mm-hmm. of course this is me blowing hot like Ooh. the wolf the big bad wolf yes. i i need the party a lot yes but so i said for the first time i'm going to get a proposer who's a woman mm-hmm. and the looks of the men in my campaign team are like who does that like and i said guys let's think about it i'm a woman mm-hmm. i'm a strong woman mm-hmm. the vice chair of this party is a woman she's been mayor of one of the municipalities in Kampala she's beautiful she's gorgeous she has ideas why can't she be my proposer and for a while the big old men didn't want me to have her cuz they wanted one of their own yeah but i went to this lady and i approached her and she said oh my god in the whole history of my time in politics i've been an, a flower accompanying the men no one has ever approached me and said will you be my pro-? so nobody so one of the biggest issues that we're facing is that even the the you know the women who have high social capital mm. or the fat cats in political circles nobody is approaching them so we are saying that women are not supporting other women but women are not exactly asking other women for support exactly, exactly. Mm. and and people th- took two weeks to process their proposals there's money exchanged there's all these negotiating of manifestos man said where's your id girl where's your id girl bring your id card and let's take the pictures and put them up on your facebook timeline i'm going to be your proposer mm. in one visit mm. all she say to me is stella stop aggressing the men stop offending them mm-hmm. until when you get to parliament be a good muganda woman <laughs> then you can get your shoe and knock it on the table of parliament yeah but right now try to you know but she was willing and she was happy and although there was a bit of discussion about my performance as a woman in power yeah i can be, 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 be a little right she was not dictating to me the terms okay so that's the first thing i wanted to say that some of the women who've gone before us are actually waiting for us to say hey mama help me mm. what's it like mm. there's a woman who's the incumbent in the position i want to run for her name is nabila nagai sempa she's been the mp woman mp of my city for the last 15 years right. she's from my party she's an opposition woman mm-hmm. there's a lot of stories told about her absence her silence and her impotence aha uh-huh. and as like you know we can all bash nabila 
I bash her sometimes. I want to replace her. I didn't want her to run. And so as part of the post saying, but Nabila has been very, very silent. When our constitution was being amended in order for uh, presidential age limits to be removed, mm -hmm. we didn't see her participation. Mm -hmm. However, one day I sat down and listened to her story on TV. And she was narrating how she's not been supported. And she was narrating why she's been silent. How she has not been helped, facilitated by the party. Yeah. And I thought, I wish I had her biography. Okay, I wish I sat and listened to the women we claim have failed to mm. represent us well. Mm. Because there's a lot I can learn by just sitting and reading her biography. But why do I need to read her biography when she's alive and I can go to her for mentorship? Mm. Mentorship is important in politics. We don't have enough political mentors, either because they are not reaching down or because we are, we not, are not reaching, reaching up. up. Okay, so I think it takes two. It's really interesting that you talk about mentorship because um, the, the mentorship among the men is clear. It's very clear. Um, and, 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 that, and that even for us with, with Kenyan political history, there's, there's groups of people that were younger when there were older politicians mm. um, kind of running the show. And then as the older politicians segue out, the younger ones rise up. Mm. And then now you can always see consistently, there's always a crop of younger male politicians just kind of waiting in the wings. But having that kind of clear chain is not, is not very, very common For women. as far as women are concerned, no. And so we find that either maybe if it is you who now, um, inshallah, you are now running maybe for the second or third term um, for your MPC once you win, Mheshmiwa. Um, <laughs> once you win, um, then... People want you to run. They want you to run again. They want you to run again. And they want to be able to extract as much from you while you're there as possible, as opposed to asking who is coming after you. Who are you feeding from? Who came from above you? Who is feeding the one above you? And so this story that you've told us um, about the lady that... No, yes, about Nabila, who nobody was supporting and who nobody knew that nobody was supporting, mm -hmm. right? Because we always assume things. We assume that because in the party things look like they're fine, that they're fine for everybody, not necessarily. Um, and so when we come back to this idea of, um, of, of, of collective participation, because everybody is usually kind of pointing at women as individuals, you, why aren't you participating collectively? You, why aren't, and we decide, fine, let's participate as a group. Um, do you think that there's room, in the same way that, um, and, and that while different people might, might, might engage with the thought differently, mm -hmm. The way, the, way, the way the lady who nominated you was telling you, don't aggress the men. And you are an aggressor. It's who you are. It's, it's not, you know, you're not going to stop being an aggressor. But then, as regards political tactics and political strategy, there are times to say certain things in certain ways. Um, and there are times to do, and that we can all, because if we collectively participate in our group, there can be the loud one. There can be the one who is quiet. There can be the one who is thinking about what is she going to wear tomorrow? Because today she wore this shade of blue. What happens when she wears another shade of blue tomorrow? They can be the one who is making sure that when you are in the late meeting, your children have eaten, you know? And so then we are all kind of sharing the superhuman burden that it would take you to participate in politics, which men don't have to bear because they're not necessarily primary caregivers. Mm. You know, because for you, it's all of it is expected all at the same time. Mm. But then if we shared the burden with you, and if women shared the burden with other women, because multiple things, more things are expected of us than are expected um, of, of, of the other demographic, then things could work slightly differently, and there might be something interesting there. Um, what are your thoughts, Meshmiwa? <laughs> okay, so first of all, Meshmiwa, I learned this word today. <laughs> um, and again, Joki says to me, it comes from Heshima. Heshima, yes. Heshima, right. Um, it feels good to be called Muheshimiwa before I'm in parliament. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for the honor because many times um, I am told, Stella, you're a joke, a big fat joke. Many of the prophets prophesying over my political dream are prophets of doom, mm -hmm. and they see death even before I take off. Mm -hmm. 
right? Um, because I've been in the academic world, I've been an academic and we speak truth to power. We do research and we write it as it is. Because you're working from data and evidence. Yes, that is what I am. That is what has made my name. I tell Museveni to F off in his face using my writings, using my body, using whatever I can. I say to him, if you can't go, you're going to face my tongue and I'm not stopping, right? And so in terms of political tactics, the, 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 the journey from academic and activist, from big mouth to politician is right. very difficult. I have blundered so much in the last seven months since I was released from prison. I have blundered so much and every time I'm told, there she goes, the political failure, mm. the political loser, who's her campaign manager, who's teaching her how to do politics. In politics, you don't tell the truth. You oh. know when to shut up and when to speak. Yeah. And to, to be honest, even when they've tried to manage me. <laughs> you escape being managed. I can't be managed. I mean, look, even God, God chose I'll be the one who'd be unmanaged. Eh? Okay, so praise God those who believe in God. But what I'm saying is that you talked about who mentors us. Yeah. Good question. Who's mentoring me? For me, it's really the idea that I can be part of this liberation in Uganda. We're dreaming of revolution and I want to be part of it. I want to, I insist I'll be there. You can imprison me, but I'll be there. Mm -hmm. You can call me a political failure, but I'm coming. Mm -hmm. That is what's mentoring me. Who's mentoring me? The books that I've read in history, mm. many of which are not from my context. Who's mentoring me? The gossip that I get from women who wish me well. Mm. But a lot of what is said to me is about you won't make it. Why don't you step down? You failure, you this, you that. And the naysayers and the haters are many more than those who wish me well. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I wanted to say, that we don't have enough, even in, a, in uh, opposition parties don't have schools where we go to be taught and built. How does one traverse from being a community leader to becoming a politician? How does one change from being an academic to being a member of parliament? I yeah. don't know, no one's teaching me. Who teaches these things in your country? Maybe you'll tell me when you get the microphones. No one's teaching me. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of feeling my way from reading the stories of others and observing people such as Millie or Diambo who's coming in the afternoon. Yeah. Uh, just observing what other women I think are champions have done, reading their histories. Yeah. The issue you tackled about who takes care of my kids when I'm away, who does that? Who does like, that? Who does that? Where are the women? Mm. And and should it be their burden? Oh. I've had I've had close friends saying, but Stella, you entered the world of men knowing full well you're a single mom. What do you expect us to do? And they're saying this to me when they've come to visit me in a police cell because I've been arrested because I'm protesting against the lack of food in COVID times. Yori Museveni has collected a lot of food. He promises to give food relief to the vulnerable poor. That's the label. And the food hasn't come. The women are eating from my children's kitchen. I'm tired of feeding the women because I'm not the government. The government has collected money from donors who don't follow it up. From Ugandans who are contributing, I go to protest mm. and I'm arrested. Yeah. Okay. I'm arrested not because my food, my kids don't have food. I'm arrested because I've taken on the burden of the community. And I'm saying it's women who cook. It's women who take care of meals. The government hasn't given us meals. This is the time we should go and protest. So I've gotten some women from the sex worker movement and some women from commercial industry who's Shops are locked down yeah. during the time of lockdown. And yes. we are at a court very close to a police. I wanted the police station where we'd be arrested because at least it has clean facilities and water. So I went and held this protest right next to the central police station. We're arrested. And I'm thinking, oh, God, I didn't tell my kids. Ah. Right? Yeah. I don't know if you have similar electricity processes in Kenya where you prepay. But if the bill is about to run out, it starts beeping. Yes, and I'm do. thinking, oh God, in the morning, my son told me about the electricity. And I said, ah, I'm just going to protest. Give me your saucepans. I'll come back. And I didn't take care of the yaka. We call mm. it yaka, mm. meter. So I'm like, who's taking care of that? So I'm sending my friend, you know, why don't you help me send some mobile money to my children? And she's like, but Stella, you can't be failing to mother your children well. 
and being involved in a process where men who have wives are getting involved. And so the story you ask about who's feeding the children of those at the front line is an important question. And if women were asked, who's sleeping with your husband when you are in political office? Yeah. Because you have to go back and sleep with him yeah. once in a while, <laughs> or maybe all the time. But who's sleeping on, with him for you? And also, nobody asks the wives of, you know, of, of the male politicians who is, you know, who is sleeping with you while because your husband is on the campaign Because they assume that women can go without a fuck for a long time. Mm. That the men, those, those issues, you know, but women. Yeah. Okay, and, and so, while I've used the wrong metaphor, yeah. guys, I studied human sexualities, forgive me. My examples all come from there. But, but, but it's an important question. Nobody's going to sleep with my husband for me. But I'm expected to be a good wife, a good mother, a good sister, a good house taker, a good kitchen manager, a good, oh God, like just, oh God. And then I'm a good politician. I think it's interesting that you pointed out um, the story of the women who came to chastise you while you were in prison. Mm. Very good friends, by the way. Yes. Very good friends. As they are not strangers. No, no, they no. They are not enemy. No. They are women who are like, but Stella, will you manage? <laughs> I, and I think that's part of, part of the collective process, uh. I think, is, is the idea of the collective journey, that we come to political consciousness together, such yes. that then we understand what is being asked of you so deeply that we don't question why you're doing what you're doing, and we know that what we need to do is figure out how to plug in the gaps. So maybe we will not sleep with your lover while <laughs> you're on the campaign trail, but we will make sure that the, 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 the prepaid meter for the electricity is paid, that there is food and in the house. so just there, that little story ends with the landlord's wife. Yeah. Who then visits my sons and says, I've seen your mom again. She's arrested. I've been yeah. arrested four times in the COVID-19 lockdown. Yeah. In the last... And she says, I've just seen... Yeah, I mean, the lockdown was in March. Yeah. But but I'm, but I'm being arrested for doing what I should be doing, telling yeah. the government to take care of us. But mm. she says, hey, I saw your mom on TV. Okay, A very silent woman. She's not a politician. She's, she's just a rich woman going on a, with her life. Yeah. I saw your mom on TV. She's speaking across the wall. Yes. Okay. My kids are this side of the wall. Hers she's on the side. other side yeah. of the wall. Hey, and, and, and do you guys have supper? And hey, did she remember to do the gas? And hey, how is the electricity? And mm. hey... And so this woman buys food. Mm. I didn't invite her. I didn't ask her. I mm, didn't. Mm, mm. And those women and men are never acknowledged. Right? But I want to acknowledge Pamela. She took care of my kids in that moment. Yeah. And I could be busy being a political prisoner. My kids were taken care of. Yeah. Nobody knows about Auntie Pamela. But we need very many other Auntie Pamelas. Maybe yeah. you won't be a... Muheshimiwa. Yeah. But you could but be, you can be Auntie, Auntie Pamela. Pamela behind Muheshimiwa's yeah. life. You know what I mean? Mm. We, we, we cannot all be there. We cannot and we all should be, not all be there. There's, you know. But behind the Muheshimiwa are yeah. a line of so many people from the woman who say to me, your lipstick needs a bit more, to the lady who gave me breakfast, to yeah. the ladies who brought me here, to Civ Forum, to you who came to moderate, to you who came to touch the microphone and say, but Stella Nyanzi, one-on-one, -on -one, etc., etc. Yes. There must be women and men, but women supporting us mm. in the journey. Mm. And maybe the acknowledgements will never be made. Maybe they'll never join my party. Yeah. But Auntie Pamela, who's from the incumbent regime yeah. of the dictator, is like, although we are in different parties and she's criticizing my party, she's I can a still mother take care of you. Of her children. Mm. And, and, and we need those Auntie Pamelas. I have two more questions before I, I open um, okay. for the audience. And, and the first one is... Um, in this in this idea of taking care of one another, yes. um, one of the one of the tactics that patriarchy has successfully used against women is to divide us mm. um, using lines of class, using lines of respectability. And when you talked about the sex worker movement, when you referred earlier to queer women, to trans women, to women who are considered less than other women, and so then we are all just kind of having to compete. Um, to be at the top of the barrel, thank you. To be at the top of the barrel, such that, such that, such that we are not treated as badly as the ones who are below. And so, how do we then negotiate um, with those kind of internal 
struggles within um, the women's within 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 us trying to find solidarity as women. How can we find the solidarity as women when patriarchy has us invested in 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 making sure that we are not treated as badly as I'm not treated as badly as somebody who is poorer than me, somebody who is less educated than me, somebody who is you know, a different sexual orientation or a different gender identity than me or somebody who has a job like a sex worker or a domestic worker. Um, how do we deal with those, um, those, those obviously very harmful divides amongst us? Mm. Look, the, 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 the system of divide and rule has worked for a long time. I don't know about Kenyan history, but in Uganda, those that colonized us ensured that they divided us up so much and yeah. then they could beat us because yes. there's power in unity yeah. and if we're not united, it's easier to get at us. Um, divisions, for me, I'll speak from my experience because I'm not your necessarily moral woman. Yeah. One of the first points through which patriarchal dictatorship has worked is to say Stella is immoral. Yes. When she's angry about the state or about her employers, she'll undress. Don't be immoral like Stella. Yeah. Okay. And so there are very many women who've taken up that line. Yes. And because it's about nudity, they're like every sane person walks around dressed. This woman is insane. In fact, they went to the court and had an application to have me subjected to involuntary medical exam mm -hmm. when I was in prison, in custody, mm -hmm, their custody. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the idea that anybody who is associating with me is going to be infected, contaminated with immorality and insanity runs high in my country. Right. And many times the purveyors, the carriers, the vectors of this form of smear campaign yeah. are not men. It is women as educated as I am who bring their religion to me and say, she is demon possessed. That is why she undresses like the man with the mob. Remember the man with the mob when Jesus was where? I don't know if it was the Sea of Galilee or mm -hmm. if it was Lake Victoria. Mm -hmm. And the man with the mob came. And when the mob entered him, the mob of pigs, he ran to the lake or what? I don't know which, whatever. Yeah. Was it a river or the ocean? But you know those Bible stories. Yes. So the idea that nudity and nude protests that women have taken on effectively yeah. is only used by the insane. And those who will defend these amazing modes of protest are equally insane. Mm. Is used to, 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 to make women just paralyzed. Stella Nyazi, huh? You mean the mad woman? Huh? They even wanted to take her to Butabika. Butabika is a mental, a national mental health referral yes, hospital. Ours is called Madhari. Okay, so they want to take her to Madhari for, for mental exam. And you're there supporting her, okay? And so divisions are used not so much because the idea of nude protest is has never problem. been used by men. Mm. Or because they say, ah, but it's so uncultural. She is so, she's copying those things of Bazungu. And I'm like, things of Bazungu? <laughs> Your grandmother was walking around in a bit of skin. Yes. Or back cloth, whatever it was. Yeah. I stayed in my panties. Every time I, I protest, I stay in my panties. I'm keeping the pussy for my husband. Only my husband, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I protest with the rest of my body. Yeah. And so the idea that we are demonized, psychic, psychologize yes it's an old one because this is people have said this about women forever exactly yeah and yet it's very powerful the, the modes of redress or the modes of descent that we use as women where we employ our very own bodies yes i mean no no i have to pay nobody to expose a bit of nipple mm. and the nipple works now when there are two bazookas on the front line, the men can't handle it, my sisters. They can't. Ask me how I've changed things that I've spent 20 years, 30 years in a state of inertia. Mm. You bring your nipples to the front line, those are two bazookas, and sometimes the grenade of the belly button is also there waiting to explode. <laughs> things change, but people use this against us, mm. right? The cost and is high. The cost is high, but it has to be paid. Yeah. I'm happy to pay the cost. Right, and after I learned how effective it was, Museveni in my country knows how to use the police with their guns and the prisons and the courts, but they don't know how to shoot away at a nipple that's on the front line. Mm. They don't know how to arrest a naked belly button that's been exposed in court. Mm -hmm. And they should wait for the day that I bend over and show them my buttocks. Mm. 
I have not yet done that. The day that I tried to do it, the podium was very high. Mm. Why am I going into this? Is because, look, all women once in a while, at least if you're healthy and hygienic, you wake up and change. You wake up and bathe. You walk around with your body. I spend nothing, no money. I couldn't afford to go to court. Mm. I couldn't afford to get lawyers. I couldn't afford to get the public media. Do you know how many TV cameras came running when I did this form of free coverage, free airspace? So I don't understand why people who have invested nothing in letting the cause go forward shouldn't come and ally with me. So I say to other women, refuse the division. Mm. Okay? Even if you're from another party and you're a fellow woman, you have seen how powerful these tools. I'm not asking you to join the nude protest movement. No. I'm not asking you to speak like I speak. When I say Mseven Imatako, Botako, that is Luganda. Mseven is a pair of buttocks. That's the translation. I'm not asking you to do the same. Do not become Nyanzi because you won't become Nyanzi. But you can ally with her and explain the powerful impact of this and show how it is grounded in history, in African context, and how it makes sense as a weapon mm. of those who don't have, of minorities, of the poor. And that you've actually pointed out um, when, you, when you talked about the cost of running for parliament, um, there's also the cost of getting public eyes. And you talked about... Um, totally free of charge. Exactly. I mean, the only thing is, once in a while bad boys write on my Facebook about how they're using my nude protest pictures in the night. I mean, and you can't, you can't stop them if, if that's what's helping if, their lives. If it, it helps the revolution, go ahead. <laughs> no, it wasn't the intention, but if it helps... And, and so all I'm saying is the very organs of division yeah. and derision, yeah. and uh, they make a mockery of us, we can use them as stepping stones to wherever. I, the publicity you mentioned. Yes, yes, yes. I don't have to campaign. No. I go up to places and people say, hey, well, I'm going to vote for you, Stella Nyanzi. I've seen, a, uh, I've seen your nipples. I've never seen the nipples of all your other eight contestants. At least I've seen you. And I mean, it's a fair point. Well, well, if it makes sense to them, like I said, part of the revolution, I'm going to parliament using the nipples that you saw 20 months ago. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. But what I'm saying is, if they want to divide us, we have to consciously and intentionally be calling people back to us. We, to have, say, to, we have to Sex resist. worker, you're mm. my sister, I mm. don't judge you. Yeah. You woman who had an abortion, I'm going to work on the issues of abortion for you. Yeah. Young lady, you got pregnant while you were still in school. You're yeah. a disappointment, but don't worry. I understand your story. Come, let us unite. All of us. And I talk about the oppression. Those of us who are oppressed... Let's unite against our oppressors. Mm. Come and vote for me, right? Mm. Mm. We can tell the stories of methods later. Yeah. Maybe I'll need to go for psychotic help later. Mm. But as long as those that rule and dominate us are actually insane, we can't keep our divisions and separations along lines they define for us. While we're speaking about, and this is my last question, yes. uh, before we go, we'll have actually have a poem by Shiki, and then we'll kind of hear from the audience. Okay. Um, while we're speaking about lines that have been drawn, mm. there's an increasing disenchantment, not just on the continent and not just in this region, but globally with the idea of the nation state and the nation state as defined by the colonizer. Um, and what, what is it that makes us define ourselves as, as Kenyan or as Ugandan, except for the accidents of, of happenstance. I happened to be born within this political um, arena and that the country is an entity that is handed from one generation to the next to the next and it is supposed to be the grand thing that we cannot question. Mm. We cannot question that particular type of belonging. And so does seeking political power reinforce a nation state narrative, or does it challenge it and ask it to become different um, in the interests, in the public interest? Right, so so we, we in Uganda, we have ethnic groups, mm, yes, yes. ethnic tribes. We do here as well. Right, and my tribe is Baganda. Mm. We have our king, we are a monarchy, and there are very many other ethnic tribes that were centralized in terms of government before colonialism. Yes. Then colonialism fucking went and happened. And uh, we were divided up in the scramble and partition of Africa. Mm -hmm. And I think until we do something about that great injustice that was done to us, mm. until we redress it, yeah. 
and become, I don't know, United States of Africa or something. Right. We've tried Comesa, we've tried these East African ESC, communities. Yes. It was impossibly, it was almost impossible for me to come to Kenya mm. on Monday. Um, until we change our constitutions that say Constitution of the Republic of Kenya, Constitution yeah. of the Republic of Uganda, until we are intentional about breaking those barriers, those borders that were created for us. Yeah. That we have, you were talking about socialization. We have socialized these things. They define who we are. You're yeah. different to me. Yeah. Not because you're different to me, but because you're Kenyan and I'm Ugandan. Mm. And those are not our definitions. Until we do something about those things, we may as well work with the nation state. With, right. With those colonial demarcations and definitions. Now, the thing for me is, do we sit around waiting for Africa to get united? Right. Or do we participate in those processes as flawed as they are, very consciously aware that... It is, it is a dystopia. It is. Yes. Um, but what do we do? Yeah. Or, or should we stand and point at it for being a dystopia until it, you know... And I think... For me, who's now very much, I'm vested and interested in power because yeah. power affects so much. Yes. I want, I want some of that power so that we can redistribute and send those who dominate us yeah. that side yeah. back. Yeah. I will participate in the processes as they are. And hopefully, we shall dismantle them as we go along. Mm -hmm. But for now, I think refusing to participate is failure in itself. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yes. I hate the idea that I can't do things with Kenya without permits and licenses and God knows whatever else. Mm. That to attempt to do things across borders becomes illegal. Yeah. As if my grandmothers don't live across the divide. Yeah. I, I hate that idea, but what do we do? Mm until the borders have been redefined by ourselves for ourselves and those that come after us, I think we shall have to work with them. Yeah. And so your question was uh, disenchantment. Disenchantment is not enough. Be disenchanted, but do something about it to change it. So we shouldn't be disenchanted and then despair. I think be disenchanted and do something to take away the disenchantment. Huh? Okay. I'm not sure what it is. I'm not sure that the regional blocks are helping. Mm. Right? We have problems there already, and COVID-19 showcased these things. Yeah. If we see what uh, His Excellency Magufuli is doing and what our own are doing. I mean, my president, Yoweri Museveni, dictator, went into Tanzania this week, and he was wearing a mask, and his entourage were wearing masks, and they had sanitizers and everything. They get to State House, and His Excellency Magufuli and his team are not wearing masks. No. <laughs> okay. So how do we even unite? Mm. And a very simple example. Very simple. How do we even unite our, across y Uganda, Tanzania? When Kenya? on when on one thing we see things so completely differently, and we are torn apart in terms of policy and taking care of nationals by these boundaries. Yeah. Why aren't Kenyans and Tanzanians doing the same? Or right. Ugandans and Tanzanians? Right. Because of those colonial... Yeah. And it's not power does. Mm. Power has ways in which it defines us. And I think until we get some of this power and we dismantle that historical damage that was done, yeah. we shall remain disenchanted and die. But I want to be disenchanted and use that as fuel. Mm. A lot of what I do is fueled by anger and rage you at can, the injustices of history. You can be disenchanted and still hope, like Atieno's poem. Exactly. All right. Um, let's give let's let's give Mheshmiwa a hand, please. <laughs> um, could we just go and sit there while Shiki comes on stage for the performance? It's okay. I'll take care of that. Um, while Shiki comes on stage for the performance, and then after that, we'll go into a question and answer session. Asanteli, let's give Shiki a hand. If you woman cannot cook, then you are not a woman. No man will stay with you. You woman cannot keep a man in your pocket. 
if you woman shook loose your curvaceous figure, then your man is entitled to look at other options. Weigh those options. It is allowed. You woman brought it upon yourself, you should have maintained your figure. If you woman dare speak back at your man, then you are a woman trying to be a man when there is already a man in the house, so shh, no questions allowed. You do not wear the pants in that relationship, know your place, woman. Know that you will always be an object, a person not entitled to property because objects cannot own. Cannot even own your last name for it is given to you by your spouse. One of the achievements us women are to look forward to. Like our parents didn't give us names. Didn't give us titles that we can be referred to. Cannot even own your kids because they ain't your kids. Apparently, Watoto ni Wababa, so you, you just become the life giver. A womb that houses generations that cannot be traced back to you. Your name is not worthy to recognize on the family tree, so you become the roots. You do all the work, and then later realize that no one will ever praise the beauty of a tree by its roots. And just because dowry is given for me, it doesn't give you the right to mistake appreciation for purchase because you do not own me. You will not reduce me to an object again, that B from downtown, that side chick you want to get your freak on, that classic vixen from your music video, so understand this. That this is more than a revolution, it's a fight for respect. Clap your hands and dance around this altar of rage, brother, you are about to be burnt. Understand that this is Wangari Mathai on heat. Understand that you stand in the street of democracy with the rage of Afghanistan. Understand that I come to you with the heart of a priest but with the fierceness of a gangster. Understand that the untamed spirit of Nelson Mandela, the vision of Martin Luther King, and the wisdom of Mahatma Gandhi just got burst in my voice. And if you do not understand anything, understand that I don't need a man to tell me where or where not to be. I know exactly where my place is. Uh, let's give Shiki another hand, please. Asante sana. Asante sana. Um, Mahishmiwa, yes, I'll invite you to come back up and sit. Um, let me grab you. I'll just take care of it. Hand over chair. Thank you. Um, questions, Tafadhali, from the floor. Yes, there's somebody there. Is there a mic, please, that can go around? Actually, no, there shouldn't be a mic going around yeah, because COVID. What are you going to do about the mic going around situation? In fact, I'm already stressed by this one, which I have given to somebody and taken back. Come and sanitize this one. There's another one here. Okay, I already have four questions so far. Let's start there. I'll come to the back just now. So, uh, pass or oh wait? Yeah, she'll come, she'll come this way. So, that's fine. This is not ideal. Um, good afternoon. My name is Chepkoich Towet. I am from uh, the oldest party in the country. Our party of independence, that is Kanu. And... Uh, Thank you so much, Stella. You are a fresh, you are a breath of fresh air. And um, I think what as young people would say, uh, this is what we need. And uh, this is the kind of inspiration and uh, courage that we need. Having said that, you've extensively talked about uh, political parties in Uganda. I happen to work for one. I sit in the secretariat. I head the women desk. As a young woman, I am very proud of myself. Let's give a hand, please. Whether you agree with Kanu or not, <laughs> let's give a hand. Yes, that is an achievement I am proud of as a woman. So despite uh, our political views, I think it's a, it's, it's a good step. So uh, you've talked about the political process within the political parties. And I've always said this in all uh, political forums I've been in. All our root evil begins from the political parties. So if within ourselves we can change within our political parties, and yeah. I liked what uh, Njoki said, if you want that change, you have to be within where that change is happening. And most of the young women are shying away from politics. Let me mm -hmm. tell you, you said, women ask, how does politics affect my life? Right now we have seen it in COVID. It affects every aspect of your life. So if you can, please, I am asking you as my fellow young women, to join political parties, whatever your ideologies are, look for a party that resonates with you. 
join one and let us fight from within because we can only make the change from within. And when we get into the political parties, like you said, let us not sit back and be assistant whatever. It is good, yes, to have that title, but let us sit on the table. They said, if you're not on the table, you are on the menu. So you choose where you want to be. Mm. So let us always fight to be on the table and not the menu. Let us discuss women issues on the table. Why is it that it is men who sit to discuss women issues and there's no woman sitting within there? So let us fight as young women to be part of it and also pull the men who are called gender champions to fight with us. Because as we know, uh, this fight cannot be won by ourselves. And the goodwill also within the political parties, we have to look for the uh, for partners within political parties. There's something President Uhuru did in 2017. You remember we didn't have any elected female governor. And he made it his business. He said that he's not going to sit in another council of governors without women in it. So he made it his business to make sure that he has at least one elected woman governor. So the goodwill is within our political parties. We need to find who are the gender champions within our political parties. I, I, I think, my sister, that's a very useful thing. You said, let's give a hand to Fadali. Yes, thank um, you very much. Um, I, I hope I've not I mean, taken too no, much No, 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 not at all. I actually have a question for you okay. because you're speaking directly to our context here as Kenyans. And, yes. and I've noticed you've not asked Meheshmi a direct question. So mm -hmm. yours was a comment and it was a very valuable one. How do we, mm -hmm. as women who are not members of political parties, how do we, A, join political parties, and B, how do we support women who are officials, who are standing, who are working within the political parties, if not all of us necessarily have the time or the resources or whatever, how can we still support this work? Because this is, a, this is, a, is exactly what we were talking about. Okay. Um, I know, sorry, I know why I've given it to her. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, you've sanitized. Excellent. <laughs> Asante, um, yes. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll hear from your colleague. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Ruth Bolo. I am also a very proud member of the Kanu Party. I also serve in the Secretariat, and I think that is why she passed it on to me. Uh -huh. So, number one, you realize that in the universities, we have so many young women currently going for those positions, for those uh, leadership positions in the university. But the bridge between the university politics and the national politics is quite huge. We do not have anybody who is working with the young girls and showing them how different it is. How do you maneuver in these political parties? And so if you go to a lot of those women or even any other young woman who um, you know, has been in that field and you tell them, I am, I am in politics, they'll be like, eh? You know, eh, you're in politics. How? There is that disbelief of what are you even doing there? Yeah. And it is because there has been a lot that is told of how difficult that journey is and how bad that journey is. And so it then makes the young women feel quite, quite scared. So what we have done as a political party, I don't know about the others, and, and maybe this can be coped, is we have ha made it very intentional from our party constitution, the places of women and young women in the party. So in the po political party structures, we have, if they are six men, there must be six women also. So it is not a two-third, it is 50-50. Are you saying, wait, are you saying so, that Kano, yes, in general, yes, are doing 50-50 yes. participation? If are you, you saying this for the record so people can hear? I, I, yes, and I, I'm saying it for the record. If you look at our youth league, we have three men and three women in so the national is this, wait, is, this, our, is this the youth league alone or the party in general? No, no, that's what, I, that's what, that's what I'm trying to, 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 to tell you, the structures that we have. Uh -huh. So in the youth league, it is 6-6. Six, six. Okay. In the mainstream, for so long, it has been five men and one woman. Uh -huh. And currently, in the recent neck, that was changed. It is now three men. Three women. And three women. And by neck, you mean the National Executive Committee? Yes, National Executive Committee. They passed that. So if you look at the, at the main structure where their chairman, Gideon Moy, sits, mm -hmm. which is total of eight, it is four, four, four. And out of those four, three women sit in the National Executive Committee. So women, it is intentional that women sit in the decision-making tables. Okay. If you look at, if you look at um, the recent management committee that was formed, we have women sitting in those seats as well. I want to ask so, you a question. Sorry, and, and, and that I completely appreciate what you've said. Um, and that question is as regards 
because because you and and rightly so and that I, I think even even Uganda has a very strong history of people who are involved in university student politics then going forward to become involved in national politics that trajectory is a known one in our region I'm interested in political participation for people who may not necessarily have gone into tertiary education you've not gone to university and then the wide wide bridge you're talking about becomes even wider yes. for somebody who maybe like something happened maybe you dropped out of of secondary school or maybe you finished secondary school and went straight into the job market so how do women like that start to plug into party politics okay so one thing i always say is that you can be active in a political party even for 50 years but you will never move up the ranks why this is because we do not know how to align ourselves so this is what i would advise if you are interested in joining a political party and you do not know where to begin from. The best advice I can give you is to start from your, from your most local point. You have never been involved in anything to do with leadership and governance, but you want that space, start from your local, most local point, the most grassroots level. Say if in my ward, for example, I know that uh, Rosa is active in this political party. Rosa is from, from NAC Kenya. So I know Rosa is active in, in this political party. Go to her. Approach her. Because just like she said, a lot of times we do not reach out to those who are ahead of us mm -hmm. to work with us those journey. So start from there. Once you have established that very stable um, platform or very stable base, then you can begin to move up. And you align yourself and volunteer. Just, just let me clarify on, and really stress on the point of volunteering. If you're good in taking minutes, for example, or writing, when you're having a meeting in that party that you have just joined at the grassroots level, volunteer your services and do those minutes. If you're very good at, at talking with the mic, at moderating, volunteer your services. Someone is definitely going to spot you. And at that point, then someone is going to say, but you know, we, we went for a constituency meeting somewhere and there was a lady doing A, B, C, and D. Why don't you call that lady to do it? And that way you find yourself, you know, starting to familiarize yourself with the leadership of the party. Asante Sana. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let's, and and let's, as, I, as I close, I know I've talked a lot. You I have, and you're a politician, so I'm watching out, you carefully. And I know. I just want to shout out to your youth lead at Forum, Walid Lubega. He has also done quite a lot to, to bring the young women on board. Asante Sana. Let's give her a hand, please. Um, have you sanitized your hands? Hey. Okay, good. Yes. Wevery. Uh, my name is Magiri Florence. Uh, I studied in Uganda, that's why I, I, knew, I know a lot, a bit of Luganda. Uh, I first ride, not the first, that was the first and the last actually, maybe in future I'll ride. In 2013, I was very young. I would just come from a career university and I went to Madare and ride. And what did you ride for? MCA. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I, the experience I experienced is that, you know, when you come from university, like the way you say it, and when you come to the ground, it's different. Very. There you meet people who have not been tertiary education, and they don't know about leadership, and they don't know why should a woman be voted. And when I fell, I didn't capture the seed. I decided to do sensitization on young women in my area yeah. to, to know how, how important it is to, to join politics or to be in leadership position. Mm -hmm. And my question is, how do you... I don't know how I'm going to frame this question because I've been having difficulty between boy child and versus girl child. We are empowering more girl child than boy child. And um, it's like, it's like, it's a what? It's a, uh, it's like I'm coming, like, it's a, how am I going to explain it? It's like people are, are saying that, why is it that you are, you are empowering more girls into leadership right. and you are leaving behind the boy's child? Mm. How do I you know, incorporate, and I'm doing it in a nice way. Yeah. It's like, it's a radical way at the same time. Right. Because there are no positions for young women. We are, women are not coming out, you know. And, and, and so, and so it's even, so hard. it's really interesting that yeah. in a sense you've answered your own question because you can see, no, in the, in the sense that, and I'm yeah. not, I'm not, I'm not, this is interesting even for me, yeah. um, because you've pointed out that nobody is empowering Apparently nobody, and I'm using the word apparently yeah. very deliberately, yeah. apparently nobody is empowering men, mm -hmm. but at the same time, there are no electorate positions for women at all. Oh. So you can see that there's, a there's something false there. One yeah. of those things is not so true. It's a backlash. Yes. So the I'm, I'm asking Estella, how does she handle the backlash? Okay. 
Um, um, Meheshmiwa, how can you answer that question about the idea of when we empower women, we are somehow allegedly failing to empower young men. Is that true? Um, and what do you think about that? So you want to write it down and then answer a bunch of questions? Okay. Thank you so much for your question, my dear. Thank you. Um, there was, yes, there was this lady. I think I will come this way and then we'll hop over to the back and I had seen somebody's hand there. All right. Thank Asante. you so much, Joki. And thank you, Stella. My name is Stella Nderito. I am founder of an initiative called Dada Power. Dada means sister. I don't know whether you're able to learn a bit of Kiswahili. Uh, and I'm happy to see Florence, who we are both members of the Political Leadership and Governance Program. And I'd say it's actually a debate we can go on and on about girl empowerment and boy-child disempowerment, yeah? But then uh, my question, Stella, would be, when it comes to security, um, how do you go about your security? Because uh, in my research about women candidates, the issue of security is such a big concern because I know it's, it, the ground is not level for women and men candidates, yeah? Because you see uh, more women are not able to campaign at night, well, men can, so that. And also about from where you sit and when you look at the young voter, how would you advise when it comes to raising the next generation of gender equality champions, both women and men, who are conscious about institutional patriarchy? Um, and, and by patriarchy, I mean male dominance and female subordination across board in the religious institutions, mm. in political parties, because mm. that's where the issue of youth leagues and women leagues come in, yes. you know? Yes. That you're trying to show young, and I'm actually a youth worker, so when it comes to youth leagues, yes, we, a political party has youth leagues, but then how powerful are, are the they young people? Yeah, mm. Are they at the periphery or are they at the center of decision making? Because I don't want to be part of a political party where I'm an active member of a youth league, but then when it comes to the real deal, real power, making decisions, uh, talking about money, I have no power. Mm. But then the old men are there, they have so much power. There are no young women. Actually, women are also a part of the periphery uh, matters, yeah? So how do we strategically talk about institutional patriarchy and not just being part of an active youth league and I'm not at the center of, of making decisions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let's, let's the, the mic was supposed to, wow, wow. Okay, so the mic will go there and then it'll come back in front before it goes to the back, Asante. Thank you very much, Njoki and uh, Stella. My name's uh, Halima Kahia. I'm from Ojia County, Northern Kenya. It's a pleasure being here today. And uh, as Stella said, I come from a patriarchal society, a society that has not elected a women into leadership since independence, Northern Kenya. It is only the year 2017 that Ijara, a member of parliament, Sophia, Sophia Abdi made to the seat just because she has been fighting since 1992. Now, our biggest challenge, I'm running a community radio station in Wajia, empowering pastoralists, and we are trying to change the mindset of our people, that women have the capacity to lead, and women, in democratically, they are supposed to take leadership position, but that has never been forthcoming. In our society, we have something called negotiated democracy, and still we are unable to understand who is negotiating. Because in the negotiation democracy, those who are sitting are men only. Women are not supposed to participate in those elderly meetings. Women are supposed to be in the kitchen. Women are not supposed to lead. What's happening at the sound? Therefore, my question to Stella is, it is like we are coming from the same society. So how can we change this narrative? It has been long since independence. It is not changing. So where is the problem? Is the problem the men or is the problem is with the women? Because the population of women in Wajia County is more than men. So why can't we elect even a single woman or a woman into position? Our nominated MCS are called flower girls. And that really... It is a pity because we could not make it because it is men who denied us. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they are calling us flower girls. Yeah. So how can we change that narrative? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there's, there's, there's somebody here in the front. Please, please, Tafadali, her hand has, has been up for so long. So we'll get this question. Then there's the lady in yellow. And then there's somebody at the back um, with that. 
Um, I think the mic is useful because they're recording. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Again, my name is Rosa Wango Karioki. I'm from NAC Kenya Party, party led by a woman. So my issues may be slightly different. But my, my, I have one question. What is the role of the media? As in seriously, in terms of even enhancing women development, women participation in politics, what women are doing at the ground. Because I know women are doing something and they do a lot of things in a day. So what is the role of the media and what, what can we do to help these media people enhance our, our, you know, our, our, our goals, our development on the ground? Again, uh, my last question is on the issue of why women do not want to join political parties. Do they know the role of a political party and how it enhances and determines their future in this country? Because a price, the price of bread is determined by politics. You moving from here to Uganda, or you even having that access to Uganda, you having access to Tanzania, you having access to anything, is politics. So when we stay comfortably at home and, and to, leave to people be, like... To be fair, to be fair, is it comfort that has women at home? Uh, no, no, no I'm fair. talking about young people. Because yes, yes. Right, now, right now we have access to everything. We have a smartphone. Uh, we are in college. We are for, for those who are. For, for those, those who, who are. And, and, and for those who... I, I, and others who are trying to run away from home because of life mm. issues. Yeah? yeah. Do they know the role they can play in a political party and how it can change their lives. And, and I mean, for me, as, as, as somebody who has never been a member of a political party in my life, and I will say that openly, yes. because it is true. Yes. Um, I, the idea of knowing what a political party does for me, I think should be the political party's job to tell. No, no, Joki, that's where we go wrong. And I'm going to, allow me to say we have the, we have the elite, Allow me to say that. We have the elite who, who have left the political and the price of bread and the price of milk and the, to the politicians. So when me and you can afford, uh, we can afford to have a hundred bob for bread and milk. Me and you, because we live, we are working and you know, middle class, you know, that kind, we, are in, we are in a certain group. But these other people who don't have a hundred bob to spend are the ones who hurt Joki. No, 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 and, and, and here's the thing. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not fighting you on the, on the, on the thing yes. or, or debating you. Yes. I'm just saying that as regards the, the uses of a political party, when you, when, you, when you talk about the role of the media, that's one of the things that the media can be doing, telling yes. us about why political parties are important. That's why people who, young people who are in political parties, because again, until today, to know somebody with my eyes who is a member of a political party, I did not. Okay. Right? So I have like I've seen three, four women, five today here in this context mm -hmm. who are members of political parties. And so even this conversation about the usefulness yes. of a political party, which yes. Meshmiu alluded to and which you are strongly, strongly um up upholding, is is that it is it is you have to teach me and you have to teach the women in this room and we have to teach everybody else about why political parties are important. And, and if I may say my last point, so that I can give somebody, chapter six of the constitution, for us to actually have the right people, it starts from the political party. So if you have, sorry, I'm going to mention names. If you're going to, it, it is, the ODM will give Babu power eh, to go back to the voters. If, they, if ODM stops Babu, mm. he has no he has no powers to come back to you and ask for a vote. So but for as long as Babu is given power by a politician. By the party. By the party. So if we have a problem with a politician who's in power, we should actually be taking it up with the party. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Asante Sana, let's give her a hand, please. I am taking two more questions. Uh, there's this lady here in the yellow, and then there's the lady with the head wrap in the back, and then we'll go to Peshmiwa to, to answer. Comrade power. power. Comrade power. power. African women on the front line. Organize. Say organize, educate, liberate, celebrate. Hey. So when I say African women on the front line, you say? Organize, educate, liberate, 
celebrate. African women on the front line. Organize, educate, liberate, celebrate. Yes. You know, I, I do not, I, I am a noise maker uh, in nature. And I do not like uh, being in forums where women are seated pretty and listening. I like people being loud and unapologetic. And it really upsets me being in forums where women think they actually need permission. That you will say, uh, people are, we are not being told about political parties, we are not being invited to these tables. If they do not invite you to those tables, make your own tables and make those tables matter. And you see, we're, we're talking about women in political parties and women being in power. We have, right now more than ever, in Kenya, we have so many women in power. What have they done for us? What are they doing for us? They are being mouthpieces of the patriarchal system. So it is not enough for women to take up those seats. It is up to women to actually want to take power for women and for the society. I come from the social justice movement. It is our children who are being killed in the ghettos. It is our husbands who are being killed in the ghettos. So if your breasts don't hurt enough for you to go to the streets, who do you think will cause the revolution? Who? You know, we've been speaking about revolutions for a very long time. But until women say they've had enough, we'll keep having these conversations. We'll keep uh, having these echo chambers where we just speak to ourselves. This room as it is with the women that are here, are actually enough to cause a revolution. Unapologetic, we go strip, nude, you know, and say, by the way, you know what? We are breaking the status quo. And I am going to say this, the political parties that are there are shit. They're not doing anything for us. The status quo that is in our country right now is absolutely pathetic that when the first woman who's fucking up us, Uko Drew, when someone says something about their breast, we have women who go to the streets to protest about someone who's fucking us up. So that is the women's support that we're talking about. Where is our ideology? Are we having it right? So even as we're having conversations about democracy, about women in power, we need to talk about what ideology drives us. It's not just enough to have a vagina. It's not. And anyone who does not have an ideology is a potential criminal. Even women. And they're the ones who are hurting us. And I, I even had uh, afternoon engagements, but I've had there's another panel that is coming here. And I want to face them and tell them they've failed us. So it is not enough to just have this conversation. We are having. We need to question. We need to want that power so much. We need to be unapologetic. Stella has just told us that when she was told, uh, when she, she wanted to go for power, she was told, Niaje, turn down kidogo. Why should I? Why should I? Don't I know the power that I have as a woman? Don't I know that I am actually the change that I am looking for? So I am posing a challenge to every woman here. It is not enough that you call yourself a woman. You have to live that womanhood. And womanhood means 
power. We birth the society. So if it does not hurt us when the society is hurting, then there's a problem. So I'm posing this challenge to all of us today. We must be more. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's give our hand, please. Last question. My name is Joy Mala. I work at Power 254. Um, I like the conversations that you're having, and I'd just like to remind my fellow women and young people here in this room that up until the 2010 Constitution, women did not have the same legal rights as men in Kenya. How many of you knew that? Wangapenyo anajua that we couldn't own land, access to property, moving, like just um, kutoka outside the country. We didn't have the same rights as men. How many of you knew that? Like just a handful of us, right? So we come from a society that has disenfranchised women up until 2010. And Atatuki Sema that the 2010 constitution brought about change. This change is not being implemented because we have political leaders who are keen on changing the constitution even before they've tried to implement it. They've been trying to undermine the constitution from the start of it because this constitution is a kind of constitution that, um, as Guy says, it is a constitution of the common people imposed upon the political elite because it manages power. It shifts the power balance from them to us. But still, no one will let you know this and no one will allow you to speak the truth because um, of many causes, because they would rather stay in power, because they would rather you not know, because they know change can happen if you are in the know. And so how do we begin the change? At our workplaces, for example, it is easy for your supervisor to tell you, hey, well, say, go get tea because you're a woman. Were you employed to be a, an office assistant? Maybe you are not. But because when in Mwanamke, it's better you go get tea than your male counterpart. So we begin, um, someone talked about what you can do to shift, to change, to change how we are viewed. I think we begin by respecting ourselves first. We begin by stating our position first and claiming it and not being afraid, um, not to be afraid to be told, uh, you're being difficult. You're creating so much problems. Uh, be humble. Uh, we've been through the same situations. If you're going through the same, you should, uh, you, you feel the need to complain over and over. But then uh, I, like, I like the energy in this room and I feel that we can actually effect change as she has stated, that this is enough room for us to, to create a ripple effect and to ensure that this change is hard and it's hard by everyone. But then, um, question to, to now our panelists. So these constitutions are always made difficult to understand by um, the common mananchi. So for them to, to know what is there, it's probably through the media, media houses that have been bought by the same people who are trying to uh, put us under their feet. And then, so how do we communicate these changes to the common mwananchi. Maybe a second question. Um, in Kenya, power is granted to whoever has the most in their pockets. And it's evident that that is the same metric we used to award respect. We used to uh, award elitism. We call them elites, a wrongful use of the word, because they're actually not. They do not behave as such. But that is, that is, that is the way things are handled in this country. And even just for women who actually get to the political seats, they're probably from a very wealthy background or with wealthy godparents. So how do we actually pave this way for even just women in the grassroots to access the same political seats or
to access the same power as you as you as you like to say that you also want some of the power so that you can actually disseminate it to the people at the bottom at the bottom in terms of yeah thank you the power balance thank you so much um i don't want us to clap i feel like clapping isn't what we need to do so let's just kind of sit and steep in the questions we'll do another round of questioning when 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 Meheshmi is done answering these ones um so let's just kind of sit with the questions and move back to Meheshmiwa to answer them. Um, Thank you very much. Um, amazing contributions, amazing uh, questions, comments, examples from people actually doing what we're talking about. Um, you know, my sisters in political parties, I salute you all. How many people belong to a political party in the room? Hands up straight. Okay, let's clap for them because we have made inroads. We have made inroads. We are making inroads. And I want to salute the sister from Kanu, Chep Coet. Maybe I'm saying it wrong, but. And your other sister, uh, Ruth, because. Uh, so, the, because I'm in the opposition, I'm always opposed to everything in the incumbent party in my country. I know how difficult it is for us often to appreciate that to be a political actor takes so much, even for those who are sitting with those who oppress us. And I want to say that many times now in Uganda, especially when our political parties, somebody said, and I want to quote her right, she said, the political parties that are there are shit. They are not doing anything for us. Okay. And she's, she's right. Yeah. What I want to say is, yes, you're right. <laughs> you are right. A lot of them are shit, crap, poo poo. I use the word poo poo a lot these days on my Facebook timeline. When people say shit, because I don't have time, too much time, I write P U P U, poo poo. Okay? It's, it's a good word. Please learn to use it if you have to. Um, but, but I want to say that just being there, just refusing to sit down, down, just saying, I will participate, is protest enough. Okay? Sitting in the secretariat, sitting on the organs, sitting and saying, I belong to Kanu, I belong to FDC, knowing the name of the FDC young person who is working, um, I, I don't know if it was her or her who, who mentioned Warid, um, it is important because, again, if we are not participating in it, often we don't know it. That's where the opaqueness comes from, the ignorance and the propaganda. I want to say, answering the person who talked, so I'll kind of mix answers as we go. Um, political party ignorance, asking, how come I don't, I think it was you who said, I don't know about political parties. And our sister retorted and said, but you were saying political parties must tell us about themselves, teach us. And she's saying, but no, really, if we are oppressed and the power belongs to those in political parties, we must educate ourselves. Yeah. So I want to say that both people are correct, that ignorance is a tool of those that oppress us. They want to keep us ignorant. They want to keep you, Njoki, ignorant and everybody else who refuses to, cheat, to teach themselves. But often ignorance of the political parties in which, are, which hold power in our countries is a luxury of the elite. Mm. We can afford it because we are privileged. We're not hungry. The roads work for us. We don't have to pay tax. We are not oppressed as those others are. And so I think for very many, very many people, our countries are very classist, right? People who go to private clinics and don't have to rely on a public, on a public hospital don't need the country to work for them. They don't need to put the ruling party on its center hooks to explain why women still die in childbirth. In childbirth. And I was like that until my father, a medical doctor who had retired at 65, died at 67 years of age because he was looking for a medicine, a medicine that's not allowed to be kept in our houses. Medical doctors have rules that govern how they do their pharmacology stuff, the medicines you can have at home and medicines you can't have at home. So I was among those elitist bitches who thought, why? I don't care about politics. 
We are wealthy enough. My father can take care of us. My father knew what he needed. He knew the illness, the heart attack that attacked him. He knew where to go for the medicine. He went to the health center and there was no medicine. And then as he's driving into the main national referral hospital, he dies at the gate. Mm. The following year, exactly 365 days later, we are from his memorial service. My mother drops down at home. Our house is in between the presidential state house in our village and the vice president's house. So privilege. We have the money. We are landed Ugandans. We have land. We have property. Who cares about ambulances if they work or they don't? Mommy drops down. I'm in the city. She's on the phone to me. She's saying, Stella, I cannot lift my chest. I'm like, Mommy, I know, but you know, it's like a joke. She says, call, call, call somebody to help me. I'm like, she's... I'm talking on the phone to her. I'm talking to the hospital. They're like, we don't have an ambulance. We might find one in an hour. I'm calling her back and saying, can you wait for an hour? She's like, Stella, I really want to throw up now. I want to vomit, but I can't lift my chest. She's like, get me a car. And I'm like, I've talked to the ambulance. I call them again. They found the ambulance. There's no fuel. Mm. <laughs> they found the fuel. There's no driver. Mm -hmm. These are our public facilities. I get a neighbor to carry my mom five minutes away from the, five minutes, literally five minutes away, as she's put on the bed, she dies. And then I realized my privilege <laughs> was not enough. We had the money, we have the cars, we have everything, but when I needed the public health yes, yes. service to work for my mother or my father, they died. And then I realized it's not enough. No. To say, I don't care about political parties. I don't care about Kanu or NRM in my case. I joined in 2017, so my mom dies 26. My father dies 2014, my mother dies 2015. 2016, we lose the elections. 2017, I'm boiling with rage about the inefficiencies and failed, failed, failed governance. I need a political party. <laughs> I, I desperately realize after the death of my parents, that I cannot afford the luxury of not knowing how political parties work. work. So I've answered the question about the ignorance. I think it is very perceive. I think that those who dominate us have spread two lies. One, that if you have the power, the language of the elite, the wealth, the status, the clout, this is not your affair. Mm. Get on with your private life. Go and organize protests. Go and be in civil corporate society. Don't join the grassroots political parties. Okay, it's a lie of the enemy. Because they know when we come with whatever power we have, a degree, college education, English, or, you know, holding a mic, being able to organize and type and do whatever skills it is that we have, we are going to empower mm. the political parties. They don't want us to do that, especially the opposition political parties. I think the second lie that they tell is that, ah, political parties are so not good. They can't help us. It's a lost cause. I feel that we can penetrate these political parties and change them. I am at the graveside looking for my father and my mother. <laughs> I am looking for the election that was stolen. My rage, my anger, my acumen as an academic, my voice, my total irreverence can help my party. The question about what do we do? What is the role of political parties? Please educate yourselves. Make Google your friend. But actually, what is the role of Google? What is the, not Google. The media. <laughs> what is the role of a political party, somebody asked. Do we know? Do we even care? I think when you realize that we need political parties that work for us, you then realize what is its role before I... I know what role I can play in it. If I don't know the entity, I cannot even know how I'll go there mm. or I'll go with wrong expectations and I'll blunder, right? My agenda won't meet their agenda and I'll be an outcast. And then I'll say, ah, political parties torment us. <laughs> but no, you went in from the wrong side. So um, different parties serve different causes. Some parties are meant to oppress us. In my case, in Uganda, the incumbent regime is about authoritarianism, living Yoweri Museveni, who's a dictator in power, being as corrupt as possible, being as unaccountable as possible. Apologists of those who oppress us, huh? people who are in the service of that party that upholds Yoweri Museveni, people who will go and rape 
They are accomplices in the rape of the constitution. That party does not serve my needs. The party of the oppressors will never serve me. And so I think for me that we should not think that all political parties are aligned with our own individual manifestos. Mm. Some political parties are in place to oppress women forever. It's their history. Okay? And so I think that there is the idea we study in political science 101 about political parties and what they do. And then there is the real thing we learn and live every day about our political parties. Go and study it. Study its constitution. They have constitutions. They have manifestos. They have a record. They have reports. And then look at the leadership. What are they doing? How do they live this ideology they are preaching? Right? Um, I know what opposition political parties in my country do. I also know that very many of them are eating with the enemy because in Uganda, NRM, the incumbent political party, uses money to depoliticize opposition political parties. They make these alliances around money, it's really about money, to depoliticize opposition political parties, to sell the goodwill of those who would contest for the masses, right? And so find out the agenda and the agenda and the agenda of the political party you want to belong to. And then maybe go and make your own political party. If, if your political party, the one that you want to belong to, doesn't exist. You make, make your, your own. own. Make your own. Make your own. It's difficult, but it's possible. We've seen grassroots parties, a lot of students' movements. There was questions around or contribution around the students' movement. Some people start there and they grow it. Um, we heard of the sister from which it was it NAP? Can, what is it? NAC. 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 Yes. So kudos to NAC because I have met some of the founders and I've had their stories. And for them, it was about we want a party. The party we are looking for, it's not there. Let us go and create our own and then make sure you keep referring to why we created this party. Because political parties are living things, they are very organic, they change, and many times they change against the common good. Okay, so um, I wanted to talk about affirmative action and how finding gender champions and men who work for us and, and that question um, that it's not enough for us to just get to the political party the, th the point about it's not good enough to just have a vagina. Some vaginas are the most oppressive vaginas, right? They forget that they menstruate and when men are eating money for sanitary pads, they eat with them or they facilitate the process, for example. And so it's not just enough to have um, people doing com coming onto the table because of affirmative action. We know the women leaders we have. We know the women politicians we have. We can judge them by their record. Some of them are the most detrimental to women's rights or women's democracy or women in governance, right? And so I think uh, the same can be said about um, the affirmative action where in my country, I don't know if it's the same for Kenya, we have a quota, Q-U-O-T-A, where every district must be represented by a woman. And so that's the position I'm contesting for. I'm not contesting against men. Some elite women, some educated women, some women with cash think, who needs affirmative action? Because already they have the money to participate alongside men. But women such as myself who don't have the money or the clout or whatever else is needed, must take advantage of that women's quota. Do you have something similar in Kenya? Yeah, we have yes. women reps. So women reps. I'm a woman MP contestant to be, and I find that it is not any easier <laughs> running on the woman MP card. But also we must assess those women who are representing us on the women ticket, because in the case of Uganda, they get to parliament, they close their legs, they close their heads, and they close their mouths. So, of what use are they? So, so what I'm hearing is that a lot of times people will say, we elected women, women have not done anything. When what we should have been saying is, we elected Stella. What, what woman? is Stella doing? And when you elect her, task her. Don't just give me your vote. Your vote must be really expensive. When we elect these women, give them tasks, give them responsibility, hold them accountable. Right? Um, so the question about transitioning from the students' movement into politics is a valid question. The kind of politics we do in the universities is totally different. Yesterday I was privileged to meet some students in the student movement, 
Ni University of Nairobi, and they're in the social justice movement. And I think for them, their issues were really around monetization and how it's expensive to buy the nomination. It goes to the highest bidder, even after paying for nomination forms, fees or something like mm. that. And it's totally different to the youth uh, national election processes in Uganda. What I know about Uganda is that the incumbent regime of NRM, the National Resistance Movement, just buys, it buys the process, it, it, it buys off the opposition, and then it pours a lot of money into um, the first seven out of 11 posts, and then they'll say, do you want a position in, you want a position on the youth council? Yes, okay, become NRM, we'll make you vice. Do you want a position? You do too? Okay, you'll become chair. Do you want a position? And all of you will become NRM. You kind of get it, very corrupt. And then the, the youth leaders, therefore, are never working for the masses. They are working for the National Resistance Movement Party. And so we need, I, I heard the point about the transition from student movement into national elections, elective processes. But I think over and beyond that, we have to first dismantle the whole monetization and corruption and prostitution of national youth elective politics. Because in my country, I don't know about Kenya, I'm sorry guys, but in my country, it's really about the NRM. Again, forcefully sodomizing the process. No consent, no goodwill, money, money, money will paint it yellow. How are we doing in terms of questions? Florence um, was asking about the boy child. What do we do and how do I handle the question? So I'm, I'm often told, but Stella, you're a woman. You've done so many things for women. What are you doing for men? And I'm like, first of all, when we get there and we make legislation, because the principal role of a member of parliament is to make legislation, these laws affect all of us. <laughs> they don't first look inside your knickers to say, are you a girl or a boy? Right? Laws about taxation are not gender specific, although we know the impact will yes. most will be, be felt. Yes. But um, so, so, so for me, I say the exact thing you said. I'm a woman. I see that the girl child is not as empowered, as thought of, as catered for, as brought to the front line. Her issues are not on the agenda. Not as much as the boy child. I choose to prioritize the issue of women, the issue of girls. The boy child is important. If there are issues facing the boy child, bring them to my table. And often they say, I say, what are the issues? What are they? And then people what are they? And they're girls. Like, no mm -hmm. I just wanted to criticize you, Stella, because I had to criticize you. But if there are genuine issues, genuine issues, the boy child is, I don't know, what are they doing to boys in Kenya? Uh, to be fair, the yes. police brutality, yes. um, Public police brutality, because yes. again, uh, when people are married to police officers, when we, we all hear all of these stories. So this idea that it's only men who are getting shot on the streets, it's not necessarily true, even though, um, so like, there are many issues. So for me, I think, bring the issue on the table. There are, ge there are issues that are ge genderless. Yeah. I mean, like issues around poverty are genderless, even though poverty affects women in very specific I ways. I mean, look, everything... Every mode of oppression affects women and girls mm -hmm. often much mm -hmm. more than boys and men. Yeah. So when I say bring the issue, okay, as opposed to in my country, mm. because we have women protesters on the streets, the police are brutalizing both men and women. So when we talk about police brutality, it can never be about just one gender. Mm. Those who get murdered first are both women. And shot at and killed. We have both men and women in the opposition. And so when we talk about police brutality, for me, I think it's not gender specific. But when you talk about the arrests that happen after the police, a woman menstruating, what's the word? menstruating in a police cell without water for five days, her issues are totally different to a young man. Mm. Although they will all have lice and bed bugs, and I don't know what else you have in your police cells, that's what you have in ours. Mm. The woman menstruating needs sanitary facilities to wash, to change, to, okay? So if I talk about gendering, the response or the activism against police brutality, I know because I menstruate and I've been in jail, sitting on that pad for two days and thinking, fuck, it's burning me between the thighs, right? Yeah. 
And for my brothers, it's about food. I have a stomach like they do, and about poisoning and issues like that. I'll move on to the issue around security, because very rarely have I been asked about security. It's a new question. I forget who asked it, but it's important. Um, and Stella from Dada Power said, hey, how do you go about your security? For women, it's different. It's true. I don't think that men are threatened with rape as much as women are. I have been told by police officers, by men in the, op in, in, in the opposition, my own space, and the incumbent regime, we shall rape you. We shall make you pregnant forcefully. You, you're challenging the president. And women have been raped to silence them, activists particularly. Not so much political actors, politicians, but activists. The idea of poisoning in my country, we actually have slow-acting poison. I am recovering from visits um, because my kidneys were found with poison immediately after I left uh, prison. Things like this, we are very paranoid where I eat, how I eat. I don't think it's women specific, the poisoning and the targeting. It's mainly about how loud you are and what damage you're doing to the dictatorship. Um, but issues around staying home at night, driving in the night, entering your gate at 9 p.m. And people such as myself, for me, first of all, I refuse to be scared. <laughs> okay? Some people say I'm naive, some people say I'm reckless, some people say I'm insane. But I think if every time I thought about going to do door-to-door -door in a male-dominated space where people are high, on, especially the ghettos in Uganda, we are high on Mairunji, we are high on weed, we are high on uh, the one they sniff, air, 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 airplane fuel, because the planes are not flying anymore, so mm. the fuel has become a substance we use. Ra rape, but also violence, theft. They are there, but people live with these things every day. The women in the ghettos, they live with these things every day, right? Security is important, I agree, um, but it can also be a form of paralysis. I have known people who are so paranoid, uh, so paranoid. They won't go out, they won't participate. My liver had poison. I had a miscarriage in prison. I mean, people said to me, ah, you know, even men are, uh, are being uh, affected. Why are you calling for education of women participating in politics much more than for men? And I was like, but look, a man might be imprisoned. If he is pregnant, he won't lose his pregnancy like I did. So women must be conscientized about our own biology, which sometimes makes us more prone to easy punishment. And it's this punishment that discourages women. There are some people who say, hey, you're such a bad mother. You even lost your baby because of politics. And for some women, it would be a deterrent. But how do you be secure? <laughs> how, how, how do you be secure and still participate? I think is the question. One of the issues that are not talked about that I think affect us as women much more than men is mental security mental well-being, how we protect ourselves. I know a number of people who started the journey with me in February who have dropped out because of depression, because of stress, and to insist to them, go and get some psychotherapy, <laughs> go and see a psychologist, get some time away. I realize mental health, mental wellness are so stigma stigmatized, stigmatized as topics. Mm. But the stress of raising the money, raising the vote, standing in the public glare and being told you're insane, you're mad, you're going down, we'll rape you, your children will be sodomized. The pressure on political actors. Sometimes I've had friends whose drivers, my driver has been arrested. I've been arrested, that's part of my life, but my driver has been arrested, he has a wife and children. The issues are multiple, but mm. then what? Mm. And I, I think for opposition political actors, we don't have access to the protection by the state. And so what has helped me often has been community. That in terms of intelligence, we rely on the communities of the oppressed to say, hey, Stella, the police are coming, run. <laughs> okay? We rely on the, uh, on the communities for intelligence, we rely on them, and then we trust and hope it goes well, right? Political uh, actors who are women need security because I think of our biology, it's easy to punish us through all forms of penetration. Sometimes it's 
financial, sometimes it's sexual, sometimes it's into our homes. Mm. My home has been raided by the police in my absence. My children have been traumatized because of these police raids and these visits. My bank accounts have been frozen. All this is security, economic security. I have friends whose incomes have been sabotaged. I was fired from my job. All of this is security. But do we therefore go away and say we shall not participate? And I think for me, it's now having to rely on non-traditional, non-known modes of organizing. And so mobile money becomes important as opposed to having a bank account because the fucking country went and closed my bank accounts. <laughs> They're all frozen, okay? But having also partners who understand the insecurities within which we work. And so I want to celebrate Forum Sieve. Where is, where is Augustine? Clap for that guy there, guys. Because Augustine, I say to Augustine, you want to send me some money to come to your country? <laughs> How are you going to do it? My bank accounts were sealed off. My phone calls are intercepted. What are you going to do? And he has worked. I want to celebrate Forum Civ, Forum Civ. In my head, it's Civ Forum because they are flexible partners. We get flexible partners. Community is large. Funders, community, leaders, police. They have penetrated the police as much as they're penetrating us. And we get allies there. Okay? So security is of concern. Many of us don't think through it. We don't plan but we learn quickly along the way. And I think for women, we need, a, especially women of reproductive. I'm 45, I'm getting pregnant, I'm getting arrested when I'm pregnant for two months. What sort of crazy are you, Stella? I'm thinking it will be two weeks. It turns out to become 15 months. Like, what sort of crazy are you? But I think we should also be, I'm not going to be paranoid. When it happens, it happens. Eh? Maybe that's the recklessness that the job demands. Okay, so not a very good answer, but some sort of answer. Um, women leagues, <laughs> I'm not laughing because it's funny or hilarious, it is very sad, and it's become the big sad joke. I don't know about Kenya again. I will speak from a very painful experience. In the Forum for Democratic Change, in Democratic Party, that's another, the oldest opposition party, in UPC, which is Uganda, right is it Roy, People's Congress? Yes, but also in the NRM, that the women's, who talked about flower girls? The past, yes. The women's league in my party, what's the word? I can't even get the word. When you are so important. Like you're intentionally disempowered. Intentionally, I don't even think we know that intentional means you choose. Mm. We are not even aware we've been so disempowered. So the, 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 the level of disenfranchisement in the women's leagues. Huh? Like, 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 what do you do? You have a whole uh, committee. President, what, what? Down to the treasury. When, do you have a bank account? How can you do anything without a bank account? Like, women's league. What do you do? What do you guys actually do? Do you meet? Do you have a report for last year? Last year was not possible. Okay, the year before, the last five years. What do you guys do? Apart from wear those big blue dresses and show up as the women's league. Where is your impact? In the party. Where is your impact? For each other. Do you attend each other's barriers? At least become a barrier society, if not a women's league. Do you, do you sing at each other's wedding? What are women's leagues doing? Right, so I joined my party FDC in 2017. One of the things they have done, and that is a combination of the Youth League and the Women's League, the protesters therein, acting perhaps as individuals away from the Women's League, away from the Youth League, came and visited me in prison. Let's clap for them. But were they created to come and visit this woman in prison? Is that why we have women's leagues? You know, Winnie Mandela, uh, the South African Women's League for, for the ANC, for a while was vibrant. It was active. We could see women on the front line. Right? What are women's leagues doing today? It was that same question. Not, don't just bring your vagina. Make it a meaningful vagina. I want a vagina that is known to work 
that vagina called Stella Nyazi. Hey, it is better than 10 penises or something like that. So, so, so all I'm saying is when we belong to these women's legs, please let's make them useful for ourselves, for our countries, for those who chose us, for our parties as well, right? I've given you the Ugandan experience. I don't know about the Kenyan experience. Maybe you'll tell me a little later. Um, there was an important question from the Patriarchal Society of uh, Pastoralists and Negotiated Democracy, who is negotiating. Where is the problem? Are women the problem? Are men the problem? Halima. Halima, I want to thank you. Um, because again, when we talk about women in politics, sometimes we forget we are not homogeneous. We are different. We're heterogeneous. We're all sorts. We come from all places. I want to say that patriarchy is really, really strong where it has a stronghold. And so first of all, I want to celebrate the fact that um, Sophia Ab Abdial, did you say that the, the first elected MCA was, is called Sophia? A member of parliament. Right. So. So, so we, 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 we must celebrate ladies, women such as Sophia, because the obstacles they overcome, some of us will never know. And I think, again, in terms of support and community support and sharing her story must happen, particularly by men, women, but also by those who believe in human rights and women's rights and democracy rights and the idea that we must smash patriarchy, right? And so thanks for sharing her story. But in terms of the community she comes from, you said you're doing community radio broadcasting. That's one way we start. We start by teaching the masses. We start by teaching why it's important for women to participate. We start by saying we may be flower girls, but these flower girls have thorns. Eh? We are not denying, you see us as flower girls, but let us use your metaphor and show you we can prick. Or maybe these flower girls, I don't know what flowers do. What do flowers do? We're not just beautiful, we can be eaten, okay? We are food, these flowers, I don't know what flowers do, but we can work with the metaphors that disempower us to begin, to begin getting to, power. To reclaim them. Yes. To reclaim the metaphor and reclaim the power. Yes, and one day the flower girls can stop being flower girls and just stay at home, refuse the labor, refuse to do anything, withdraw our services, what some ways of, you're calling us just a flower? Okay, who's going to cook your food? at the party? Who's going to do your secretarial work? And I think some of the work that has to be done is us refusing to be flowers, or us becoming prickly flowers, or us working with these metaphors to debunk them. It's very hard work, okay? I want to celebrate your veil and the fact that you're wearing it, because sometimes even just having the veil on means a line has been drawn about what you can and cannot do. But the veil is very empowering. We can do things collectively as flower girls, and slowly we make the inroads. The question about negotiated democracy has to be interrogated again and again and again. If there are academics in the space, we need to work with them because they recreate the knowledge out there. Who is negotiating? If I'm not part of those negotiating the democracy, it doesn't work for me. But also what's democracy? Democracy is defined by men who call us flower girls, right? I've been asking why Kenya has never had a woman member of parliament. No, 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 woman president. Why? And I told you it's going to be very, very difficult. Even with those very, very powerful women in Kenya, it's going to be really, really difficult. And I thought, why? Because Kenya should be strides ahead of Uganda. I want to be woman president one day. Maybe not. Maybe today I do. Maybe tomorrow I won't. But why is it impossible to imagine that we can have women doing what men are doing, even as heads of state in East Africa? Why is it impossible? Why can't we have the conversation and still think we are safe. Why must I say, I want to be woman president one day? And then I'm like, maybe I don't want. Why can't I say it Just freely? Say it, yeah. Yes, like I want to be woman president. Deal with it. Right? Again, we have to start emancipating ourselves from mental slavery. Um, yes, 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 we do. Not funny, very sad. There are three more questions. Sorry. Um, that I think I want to tackle Joy from Part 2454 talked about legal rights and how for a long time women could not own land, have access to property, or travel outside the country. Sounds very similar to my 
own country. However, I want to say that in Uganda, women members of parliament have begun changing things on behalf of women. That when we get to power and we are tasked by those who tell us to represent them, we can do things, we can make change happen, right? So it's the question of what sort of woman are you taking to parliament? Not just a vagina, but a vagina that has a will to change things, right? The idea that we are second class citizens, we should be quiet, we should be humble. Uh, and she's saying, so how do we communicate? How do we communicate the need for change? How do we challenge, break the ceiling of money and participating in politics, right? It takes a lot of money to participate. She said, the, the second question she said, power is often given to those who already have, right? Money, wealth, whatever. I want to say that it is true, but there are so many forms of resource. We're talking about social capital, yeah. that many times we can ride on the backs of those who have. I think you talked about alliances and allying ourselves strategically. Sometimes it's not the woman who's most powerful, but the man with the biggest bags in the party. Ally yourself with those people and tap from them, tap from them. Because until we make politics possible for those of us without money, sadly we're going to have to work with the status quo. We plan to smash it, we plan to change things, we plan to, to change society such that even those who are without land, without wealth, without bank accounts can participate. But until we do so, we'll take advantage of the system as it is, right? Um, and then the issue about where is our ideology? What ideology drives us? We must break the status quo. It is not enough to have a vagina. Anyone who does not have an ideology is a criminal. It is not enough to call yourself a woman. And the call to participate is important. Um, it's true, I mean, that cannot be said enough. What's your ideology? What's your ideology? If you are an elite, and I think many of us here are, not to say elitism is defined by how much money you have alone, What's your position in society? The fact that you're in this room means you have some privilege, you have a talent, you have a skill, you have some power, some position in your community. The idea that we must start where we are. I'm not going to change a nation if I can't change my backyard. Violence, men are beating up women in your backyard and you're silent, but you want to be MP, shame on you. And the ma three, in the taxi you're seated in, Change things there, in this community where we are. A lady acting in, on our behalf is abusing the system, and we know it, and we see her, and we are quiet, but we want to change Uganda, like, you want to change East Africa, when you can't change your own father, he's busy abusing your sisters or the, the neighbor's children, and you want to change the world? Like, let's start changing our world small bits at a time. The question of ideology is important. On whose side do you stand? For whose service are you using your talents, your voice, your whatever it is that you have? When you appear in a place, do they think, ah, put away your corruption pockets? Or are they like, let's give her some so she can keep quiet, okay? It's important that whatever we are, salt of the earth, again, scripture. Why is the Bible coming to me a lot today? Let's be salt wherever we are, on our timelines. When hoteps are doing dangerous things on our timelines, we can afford to change that space, right? So choose to be on the side of the oppressed and use whatever it is that you have. You might just need to use your shyness. You don't have to be loud and bold and abrasive. You might just have to use your respectability to serve the cause, to bring us freedom. Your talent, I don't know what it is. Your age, your youth, okay? So all I'm saying is there are things we must insist on doing, although we are women, in spite of being women, because we are women. And the woman question should not take us away from power. Have I done service to everything? Is there a question you feel I haven't answered and it's hot? It there, needs to be answered? There were... I think there were two ladies who wanted to ask questions. We can take those questions as the last ones. Um, there was one completely at the back. And as we get to the person at the back, there was a question on the role of the media. We're going to have a session on Friday. 
Yes, please tune on to the virtual space. On Friday, part of the program is going to include a number of media experts, media practitioners, and media, the role of media in democracy. That conversation can go on and on there. Uh, I'm participating in lawsuits because of the way I use the media. We can have that discussion if anybody is interested, but let's take those two questions. I'm so sorry for that. So I was saying thank you so much, Dr. Stella, for uh, the wonderful conversation we're having today. My question also borders on, the, on, on media. How do we reject the assumption that intelligence and beauty are not compatible? Because... Uh, especially uh, during um, elections, we've seen the media coverage, especially of female politicians, which focuses more on their looks and prioritizes their looks over their policies, you know? And uh, the conversation, uh, especially, let's say, from our last election, moves from, you know, uh, especially, let me just give an example, let's say, with the women reps who ran, um, you know, who ran um, in the last election, and even look at the gossip sites. It's who has a big behind, who's more cute than this. I think we even saw a, um, a, a lady who was trying to battle and saying the video, the, the image of the video vixen was not her. Yet I've never really um, seen people or the gossip sites covering men in terms of, oh my God, did you see that man's abs? I mean, I like looking at men's abs on, 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 on magazines, but I've never seen politicians like, being portrayed, uh, being portrayed that way. And at the end of the day, as a woman, you keep on fighting all these beauty stereotypes, you know, in terms of, oh my God, I can have, you know, I can look this way and I can still speak like this. So when you were talking about at times we have to exist and uh, work with the structures as they are, does it also mean that because politics has a hairstyle, politics has a dress code, and politics has a language, and it's male, such that if, when it comes to election and you have a mohawk, you have to change it because it's not acceptable. The way, like our lovely lady here, the way she's dressed, she's not acceptable because of the way she's dressed, you know, because of the skirt she's wearing, the, you know, like the jean, you know, the jean top she's wearing, it's not acceptable. So are we also saying that as women, we need to embrace and look as masculine as we can so that we can be acceptable? And I'm saying this because uh, like Florence, I also ran in 2013. And I did not see most of my peers in political parties. Oh, as a matter of fact, I'm in a political party. It's called MDG. Uh, and uh, I would definitely encourage people here to join political parties, um, uh, depending on what ideology you subscribe to. I ran for office. And I didn't see my peers because I had just taken a break from campus. So I didn't see my peers in political rallies, in political parties, and even in social media, them commenting on political issues. And when we finished the campaign, when I was doing just the stock take in terms of asking my friends, I didn't even see you commenting on social media about political issues, you know? And when we began organizing meetings uh, for young women to come and understand you know, party politics and all that, we noticed uh, that we were speaking to the same people who care about politics. We changed our tact and decided, you know what? We're going to merge beauty with political conversations. So when we come to our meetings, you have to wear makeup and especially in learning institutions, we match beauty and what? And politics. And we notice very many women would come to the meetings, okay? And they'd share the same thing, is that when I go to a political party, I'm not accepted with my crop top. So it's like, if you look a certain way, you're not intelligent, you're not intelligent. And I've seen even right now in our media, just because someone is contributing and they look a certain way, we focus more on their hair. We're like, oh my God, look at this slay queen. What is she saying, you know? Or if you say something important, people comment down there and they're like, oh my God, Beauty with intelligence. I've never seen someone say, oh, he's handsome and intelligent. I never see, I never see those comments when it comes to men in terms of, in terms of them f saying, oh my God, he's both handsome and intelligent. So does one negate the other? And is it that we need to look as masculine as we can to be accepted? Because for us, the way we work, we see more women coming to our spaces because we accept them the way they are. Whether you have a tummy ring, we're like, you know what? It's important for you to engage in this particular conversation. Two. How do we also speak to women as voters and especially young women as voters to understand the women agenda? Because we also focus more on uh, women who are running, but then how do we also shift the conversation as well to accommodate, you know, like for women as voters, young women as voters to understand? Because if you're talking about women bearing the brunt of 
all the issues we are discussing, whether it's teenage pregnancy, whether it's sanitation, whether it's water. I mean, we bear the brunt of all that. So how do we speak to women as voters? Because we are not all, all going to run for political office. So how do we also do messaging and talk and uh, also just majorly center also women as voters and especially young women as voters? Thank you. Thank you, Bina. Can we have the last question? Please keep it short. We are um, running short of time because of the next session. Hello everyone, uh, I'm here to appreciate Dr. Stella and Joaquin Absentia. My name is Dolphin Ateno, a representative of Coalition Grassroots Women Initiative, a CBO in Dandora. So my question is on tradition and cultures. As we all know, like gender disparity has been the daily norm. Like our tradition and cultures have been only based and focused on the disparity, like men know their roles, women know their roles. And as African countries, we want to maintain these cultures. So how are we going to balance the two? Like we want to empower our African women, and also at the same time, we want to ensure that our cultures are maintained. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we can have Stella respond to the two questions. Right, thank you very thank much you. for, again, uh, amazing questions. Um, so, the blonde um, in, in, parla in, 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 in politics, the idea that beauty does not equate to intelligence, um, and what are we doing with these sexist stereotypes is an important question. I think, um, your question says, do we need to look as masculine as men in order to compete favorably, right? Amazing question. So I have dreadlocks, right? I've had dreadlocks for many years. And women with dreadlocks perhaps are a little better th than men with dreadlocks. In Uganda, we have a principle of the people power movement. People know him for his music. He was singing as Bobby Wine. When he entered parliament, he had to t cut off his dreadlocks. He had to loose his informal clothes and wear a suit and tie. Just to say that the harshness in terms of presentation is not just for women. Even men with their dreadlocks, especially in African parliaments, face pressure to look, there's a particular look of the statesman, right? And the performance of that respectability is a demand. If Bobby Wine, a ghetto boy who has risen to parliament, could cut off his dreadlocks, who can't? And so I just want, I, I want to, to preface what I'm saying with that to say it's not, the pressure is not only on women to conform to a particular statesman, stateswoman look, but there's pressure around conservatism and formality. And those of us who choose to rebel sometimes have to pay very heavy prices. My dreadlocks are associated with Rastafarianism or with traditional religion, with being high on something, or not being high in intelligence, with being dirty and unhygienic. And so for me to enter parliament with my dreadlocks is an insistence and a form of protest, and it's a signifier that, hey, I'm coming as I am. And I'm coming representing those whose voices have not been allowed into parliament, right? And so I want to say that a lot of our presentation and our look must be political and politicized, and everything about holding office can be intentional and political, right? That's the first thing I want to say. The idea that those of us who are intelligent can't be beautiful is, it, it even comes from women, okay? So for me, they say because she has a loud mouth, she's so ugly. One of the things I'm running with is the ugliness. Okay, work with my ugliness and I'll represent all the ugly women in parliament. And ugly women salute, okay? Um, because again, look, what does it mean she's ugly, she's pretty? When I wear a lipstick, I love it bold and red or purple and defiant. Sometimes totally nude, meaning I have no lipstick. Does my idea in my brain change when I wear high heels or I wear my tight jeans? when I wear my skimpy skirt or I wear my long kitengi skirt, right? And so I think that it is those of us who choose to liberate imagery, 
who are going to have to do the liberation, my sister. I want to celebrate you that you're now working with those who have umbilical, what are they called? Those pins. What are they called? Belly button pins or whatever. I have six earrings, but I'm running for parliament. Today, how many did I wear? Two. Okay, but I have six holes. S2, form two. I was in form two when I pierced my ears. And people were saying, maybe you should put tattoos over those holes so that your holes are covered. They look a bit. And I was like, but why is this necessary? I can still represent the ideas that I represent, no matter how I look. And so the liberation to liberate parliament from only statesmen in suits, that is for me to take on. That is for you to take on, to introduce the notion that I can have my big bottom and still have a big brain. It is our work to be done. But then again, is it the most important piece of trivia we want to deal with? Or do we want to appear brilliant, intelligent, bold, and beautiful, and begin to break that discourse by just showing up? Smell like a flower, think like, I don't know what. Let your thoughts cut like a sword, but look as docile as whatever they want. So I think, first of all, we call them out. Call out these issues if they're problematic. Set a discussion about them. Why aren't men's thighs talked about? Why do, do my thighs as a woman matter? Why is the man's pot belly not essential? Why is Stella Nyanzi's pot belly essential? Let's have the discussion. And that is how we begin to break the stereotypes in the public media. Um, women as voters, how do we bring them on board? The messaging that centers women as voters. I think we have to do the work again. Like I said, many of us, are so I'm targeting poor women, right? Not just young women, but poor women because they have the votes. The issues I represent are their issues. Often they're not targeted by the public media. And so we have what we call civilian or citizen journalism, okay? We go to live stream things. We go to broadcasting. We do door to door. We are packaging the message in the ghetto. I'm not wearing suits when I go to do these public media things. I'm going, I walk around with these guys I'm with are ghetto boys. And they come as they are to the studios when I'm there and I introduce them and we tell their story. And for me, my campaign team does not have to put on an appearance of civility and respectability. We come as we are. Sometimes on my team, we have dreadlock chewers of cut. I'm not saying anything, but they are there and they're with me and they don't have to wear suits. And we walk into parliament together, okay? So we, we, we have to open these doors ourselves. If they say Stella Nyanzi's team has a cameraman, look at that young man going down the aisle, look at his French cut, look at everything. He looks as he looks, but he's a medical student in his fourth year and he's on my team. And sometimes his dreadlocks are not combed, but he's still on my team. And if somebody falls sick, he's still a fourth year studying medicine and you can't take that away. So I think we have to do the work that has to be done. The last question from Daphne. Tradition and culture, what do you mean, my sister? Our traditions, our cultures are not static, right? They change with time, they change with globalization, they change with contact, they change with exposure. Also, our traditions and cultures are not necessarily perfect. Thank you so much, Stella. We, we celebrate you as Kenyans, and uh, we want to uh, give a lot of applause for Stella Nyanzi. She did a very good job. I think, I think she did justice for the questions. Let's do a better loud of applause. We are happy to celebrate uh, or to defend democracy uh, with you today, and we really appreciate your time. Please take, um, you, you, are, you, you can go ahead and take some water as I welcome Niuru Band um, to come on stage to perform. And uh, as they come up, I'll also welcome you for the snacks upstairs. We'll be having snacks as well. And for those who are for the afternoon session, um, please have the snacks and then come back uh, again here at 2 p.m. So, yeah, Niuru Band. I was standing in for Njoking Umi. Uh, it's a very um, big shoe to fit in, but uh, oh, I'm told it's black prophets that are coming on stage. Uh, black prophets, please come on stage. Um, but thank you so much for allowing me to sit in. It's Mbukimburu. I work for Power254. Thank you. <laughs> 